Rick and Morty Season 7 is just around the corner. It's been a tough year without it, but we've survived. However, the revelations from coming episodes are yet to be understood, and we simply cannot know how they will impact our daily lives. Will this be the season that forever alters our social fabric? Well, probably not, but it is technically possible. Until we know for sure, let's get lost in some important Rick and Morty theories based on info from all the previous seasons. Welcome back to Channel Frederator. I'm Keegan, and I've collected 11 videos detailing some of the most important Rick and Morty theories out there. Each one sheds additional light on Adult Swim's biggest hit in years. I don't want to bore you with more introductory dialogue, so here's what we're working with today. We'll start off with one that viewers who are paying close attention have probably already noticed. Does Rick know that he's in a cartoon? Well, watch this next video and decide for yourself. Rick and Morty is a pretty big rabbit hole when it comes to theories. And this is because basically anything is possible in it. The show goes out of its way constantly to remind us of this. Mostly by displaying to us that the centerpiece of the show is an alcoholic maniac who basically does whatever he wants without regard for anything. Oh, also he has access to a practically infinite number of parallel universes. Rick's mannerisms have become loved by us all partly because a lot of what he does breaks the fourth wall and has fun with the medium of TV in general. Now, there are usually two different thoughts that people will have when taking these jokes into account. Either they're just that, jokes that aren't meant to be read into, but this is Rick and Morty we're talking about. Have you seen how elaborately this show is structured? There are universes, like, on top of universes in terms of content. Which leads us to the second idea. What if these jokes are, in fact, Rick's cries for help? Does Rick know he's a fictional character? And if so, would this be why his outlook is so nihilistic? Rick has shown signs of self-awareness before, both in the show and also directly referencing it outside of the show. He's addressed the full-on lack of a fourth wall before in outside material, like Rick and Morty's famous couch gag on The Simpsons or multiple promos for the show that appeared on Adult Swim. But events that occur outside of the show are of dubious canonicity at best. So let's focus on what we can see and extrapolate from the show itself. As said before, Rick has broken the fourth wall many times. Now, breaking the fourth wall is a pretty common trope in TV and movies, usually through an aside said by a character or something like that. But Rick seems to draw attention to it pretty often, most notably through his use of catchphrases and direct lines to the camera. I mean, who would talk directly to a camera? Who does that? But every now and again, Rick will say something a bit more obtuse that seems to show awareness of the inner workings of, say, a TV show. In Interdimensional Cable 2, Tempting Fate, he refers to the general sequence of events of his life at that moment as a sequel, also stating that they pretty much nailed it the first time. Notice that the nurse that he's speaking to has no idea what this crazy old man is babbling about. This is because you may have noticed, but every time a fourth wall joke happens, it's always Rick. No one else in the show seems to acknowledge when he makes a fourth wall joke, and they certainly don't get in on the joke themselves. But let's take a look at the most obvious evidence for this theory. In the episodes Ricksty Minutes and the aforementioned Interdimensional Cable 2, Rick, Morty, and company spend their time watching different TV shows from infinite universes leading to infinite TV possibilities. While the episodes are mainly an opportunity for the writers and the voice actors and the staff to do basically whatever they want, these episodes also have some pretty huge implications for Rick. If there are infinite universes with infinite TV possibilities, that must mean that somewhere out there, there's a universe where Rick is just a character on a TV show. And somewhere in the back of Rick's mind, he must know this, he's a smart guy. So Rick knows that he is a TV character in other dimensions. Rick is fully aware that Rick, as an absolute abstract concept is a fictional character to some extent, possibly in an infinite number of universes. We can give him that, but can we get more specific? What about our Rick specifically? Why would the Rick that we follow throughout the show Rick and Morty do things like, say, roll credits, that's the end of season one at the end of Ricksy business? Now here's where we're going to get a bit theoretical. Scientifically, I mean. Rick is in a special situation, to say the least. The logic of Rick and Morty seems to be governed by a theory in quantum mechanics known as the Many Worlds Interpretation, first proposed by Hugh Everett in 1957. In the broadest of strokes, it put forward the hypothesis of the existence of infinite universes with infinite outcomes to infinite possibilities all existing simultaneously. But it also proposed that these universes exist in a vacuum. Individual universes, as well as people within these universes, exist independently of each other, and don't have any effect on or knowledge of their other selves in other realities. And this is, for the most part, true in Rick and Morty as well. And then, there's Rick himself, who is such a loose cannon that there's a whole 
whole council of Ricks dedicated to keeping him and other wildcard Ricks in line. Our Rick, Dimension C-137 Rick, has completely rejected this council and goes off on his own merry way, causing chaos and destruction in his wake. So this specific Rick situation is a pretty unique one and would probably be instantly recognizable if C-137 Rick were to see it on TV somewhere. Another thing is that if there are infinite Ricks that are TV characters, would that also mean that there are infinite Ricks that aren't TV characters? The short answer is we have no idea, because concepts like Infinity are really hard to talk about without getting caught up in these technicalities. And the long answer is a bunch of philosophy and quantum theory. I am not a scientist. So even if it made sense for C-137 Rick to just assume that he specifically was a TV character, why would he choose to express it so obviously and so frequently? Rick is a man of facts, not beliefs. So if he's going to continue to break the fourth wall like he does, that must mean that something somewhere must have clicked for him, right? And the answer to that is yes. In the post credit scene of the season two finale, The Wedding Squanchers, we see that literally everybody's favorite character, Mr. Poopy Butthole, is watching that very episode on his TV. And we can be certain that this is the very same Mr. Poopy Butthole that we've already met, since he goes out of his way to remind the audience of the trauma he endured at the end of the episode Total Recall. So we can be confident in saying that this is the same version of this character who just so happens to be very good friends with C-137 Rick. And the other important detail is that he is unmistakably watching Rick and Morty. Adult Swim's Rick and Morty. Which shows that in the canon of Rick and Morty, not only is C-137 Rick a TV character, but he's also a cartoon character in whatever universe Mr. Poopy Butthole is currently residing in. Since he and Rick are such good friends, and since Mr. Poopy Butthole is such a crazed fan of the show, that poor pizza guy. We can make the logical leap that Rick's been made aware that his personal escapades are on television. This scene, which initially seemed like an afterthought to season two, could actually be one of the most important moments in the history of the show so far. And this revelation brings us to something that Rick says in Rick Potion number nine. While trying to convince Morty to bury their dead counterparts so that they can take their place, you know, normal stuff, Rick tells Morty that it's best to not think about realities that don't affect you directly. Could this be what he means? Could it be that ever since realizing he's a TV character, he's been finding it impossible to shake? Is he becoming more aware of just how absurd his life is? Obviously, Rick chooses to have a bit of fun with this realization from time to time, doing whatever he wants with little to no regard for consequences. But could these actually be the cries for help of a broken man who's had his foundations rocked? Why else would we be told that Wubba Lubba Dub Dub means I am in great pain, please help me in bird person's language? As far as this theory goes, there isn't much denying the fact that in Rick and Morty, Rick is aware that he is, to some extent, a fictional character. Infinite possibilities means just that in a broad sense. But that's all big picture stuff. As far as the more specific sense goes, it's still possible that C-137 Rick hasn't quite achieved full self-awareness. It's entirely possible that he hasn't discovered that whatever universe Mr. Poopy Butthole is in has Rick and Morty as a TV show. We've never seen this realization play out on screen, so there's always the distinct possibility that C-137 137 Rick just doesn't know. One thing though is that if Rick is self-aware, the idea of himself obsessing over his own life is kind of weird, and not just because he sometimes has the world's shortest attention span. In Rick's Minutes, he chides Jerry, Beth, and Summer for being so self-absorbed and only wanting to watch alternate reality versions of themselves, while he and Morty, however, happily watch whatever their interdimensional cable system has cooked up for them. Isn't that crazy? In both Rick's Minutes and Interdimensional Cable 2, they were always just one channel flip away from Adult Swim's Rick and Morty. I like to imagine that if they came across it, a scene like the one in Spaceballs would happen. What about the business we touched on before, where Rick's actions could be a cry for help? Well, how Rick operates can be... interesting. I mean, he has no regard for consequences or the feelings of others, as he just goes off and does whatever he wants. You could argue that the reason he doesn't care is because if he does something horrible enough, he could just hop universes and start all over again. Like he's done before in Rick Potion number 9 and Lord knows how many times before that. But that's not necessarily true. He says at the end of the episode, we can't do this every week, we've only got three or four more of these tops. Which opens up a whole other can of worms about the finiteness of the infinite possibilities constantly brought up in the show. But for our purposes today, it's just not always a viable option for him. So why does he act like this? If you knew your life was a TV show, would you do the things that Rick does? It's impossible for me to say, but since you still have things like morals and self-preservation skills, your answer would probably be no. 
I hope. I hope you still have these things. You should, they're good things to have. But these are, of course, things Rick lacks. Could it be that his confidence under moments of stress is because Rick knows he'll always make it out for the next episode? Is it possible that he already knows how it's all going to end, granting him the freedom to do whatever he wants? At times it seems like if he is aware, he's actively trying to break the show that is his life by doing the outlandish things that he does. Kind of like an interdimensional Truman show. It seems like the season two finale would be one of the only ways for the show to end solely on C-137 Rick's turn. But the one big thing to remember here is that the motivations behind Rick's actions don't necessarily have to do with him achieving a sense of self-awareness. The amount of things that he's seen and done in his life would desensitize anyone to just about everything. That we can say for sure. But it certainly wouldn't help if you knew that everything you did was just a TV show in other universes. Rick believes he acts under free will, but Rick and Morty has a writing staff, animators, voice actors, everything that would suggest the opposite. It would throw Rick's perception of everything he's ever known out of order, unknowing of what's real and what isn't. There are a few ways that Rick could choose to cope with this situation. On one of many hands, he could embrace this, knowing that everything is predetermined and just taking comfort in it. But C-137 Rick, in true Rick fashion, chooses a more nihilist approach. This philosophy is most closely associated with German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche, who described nihilism as, again, in the broadest possible strokes, abandonment of both moral values and a belief in an overall purpose in life. To Nietzsche, this would be brought on primarily by the rejection of religious doctrines, which... Yes, Rick has very clearly done that. But based on what Rick's seen, it's pretty undeniable that he would probably show signs of this philosophy on both the moral and existential sides regardless. This mindset isn't necessarily meant to be taken as a downer, though. In fact, a lot of people find this school of thought liberating. If nothing is of any consequence, what's to stop you from doing... anything? Responsibly, it could be a useful tool for self-actualization. But in relation to possibly just being a TV character, Rick approaches the whole idea pretty passively and just sort of rolls with it. Hence the fourth wall jokes and the catchphrases that he busts out pretty frequently. But he also seems to be brought down just as frequently by the sheer amount of unanswerable existential questions that this brings upon him. Hence the meaning behind that previously mentioned catchphrase. And this in turn leads to him mentally retreating, rationalizing everything and forcing himself not to think too hard about things that aren't worth his time. Now, there's no denying that Rick has a brilliant mind, and minds like his tend to want to know the answers to life's greatest questions. We can't be sure if Rick ever wanted that, but what would happen if you were to venture out beyond the final frontier in pursuit of life's greatest answers? Wanting to know what your greater purpose was, and finding out that one of the answers is you say wubba lubba dub dub and belch on TV. How could your first reaction be anything other than what the butter robot's reaction was to its purpose? Oh my god. Now there's way more to unpack philosophically with this theory. We've really only scratched the surface and we didn't even talk about all the other schools of thought presented in the show. Furthermore, we still don't know a whole lot about Rick in general, really. But with Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland saying that there may be a secret plot in the works behind the scenes, is it possible we could see Rick deal with the existential crisis of being a cartoon character in later seasons? These are all tough questions, but all in all, I'll have to give the Rick is a nihilist because he's aware he's a fictional character conspiracy. There has to be a better name for that. Four real fake doors out of five. If you're a cartoon aficionado, you've probably already seen our big old Gravity Falls marathon. And if that's the case, maybe you notice some interesting similarities between that world and the world of Rick and Morty. Even if you didn't, this is a fascinating theory. Are Rick and Morty and Gravity Falls connected? Welcome to Cartoon Conspiracy. Today we're gonna to be doing something a little bit different. I'm your host Alyssa, but because we have a huge theory, we decided to ask Shelby, our super intern, to help us out. Hi. Yeah, we're gonna go over a theory that involves cryptic messages and scientific theory because we're going over these two shows, Gravity Falls and Rick and Morty. They have a lot in common. Young whippersnappers traveling through different dimensions with their elderly relatives. Chaos ensues. Science! And one ended on a sweet note, while the other is leaving us hanging off a cliff because there's no release date yet. You'd think that there'd be no further speculations. Not to mention that they're on separate cable networks. But that doesn't mean that they exist in the same universe, right? Is there a possibility that Ford Pines and Rick Sanchez are actually friends?
Although these two shows have completely different homes and creators, there are so many hints that are suggesting that these two old geniuses might have not been so far away from each other. Gravity Falls is very similar in its subject matter, mostly during season two and during the Weird Mageddon episodes. This is mostly a result of Ford Pines, the twin brother of Grunkle Stan, building a universe portal and disappearing into it for a long period of time around 30 years. The universe portal gives Ford access to travel across the multiverse. The multiverse is a hypothetical set of possible universes, including the one that we currently live in. Well, we have clues to show you that Rick and Ford had had crossings before, whether indirectly or directly. In the episode of Gravity Falls, Society of the Blind Eye, Grunkle Stan's mug, notepad, and pen go flying into the universe portal after he gets it up and running again. And last but not least, there's a clue in the real-life Gravity Falls Journal 3. Alex Hirsch released a real-life Journal 3 that is canon to the series in July 2016, with a Blacklight Special Edition that comes out in June 2017. This real-life Journal 3 shows pages that we've seen in the Gravity Falls, as well as pages that we haven't seen before. In the real-life Journal 3, there is a page that has a wanted poster of Ford on it. On the poster, there are coded messages written in cipher language. When translated, the message reads, Rick was here. If you aren't familiar with Gravity Falls' cipher language, I suggest checking out our Know Your Show on Gravity Falls to learn more about it. It's all entirely possible. In Gravity Falls, it is frequently brought up that Ford has traveled through multiple different dimensions. It's all confirmed from his possession of the infinity-sided die, which Ford claims is outlawed in 9,000 dimensions. We can assume that Ford knows about these 9,000 dimensions because he's been to those 9,000 dimensions. It's also smart to note that in Weird Mageddon 3, Take Back the Falls, Bill Cipher mentions that the dimension through the portal is completely flat. Bill also mentions to Ford that he liberated the 2D world and is now here to liberate the real world. Bill also mentions to Ford that he liberated the 2D world and was here to liberate the real world. To give you a brief rundown, Rick and Morty follows the misadventures of Rick Sanchez and his grandson Morty as they go off completing challenges across the multiverse. In the episode of Rick and Morty, Close Rick Counters of the Rick Kind, we see these items falling out of the same portal that Rick has opened up. In Big Trouble in Little Sanchez, when Jerry is taking off his helmet during marriage counseling, Bill Cipher is actually seen on the screen of the control panel. Does this mean Bill Cipher not only has a role to play in Gravity Falls, but in Rick's universe as well? We are aware that Ford's portal actually leaks out into Bill's universe. But how on earth did he end up jumping through multiple dimensions? The same way that Rick does a portal gun. The theory goes that for Ford to travel through multiple dimensions as freely as Rick does, they must have stumbled upon each other in Bill's dimension. This means either Rick lent Ford his portal gun, or actually gave him the chemical compositions to create his own portal gun. Or we can take a dark turn and say that Rick and Ford were enemies and that Ford actually stole Rick's portal gun. What we do know is that Rick has access to the dimension that Ford's portal leads to. Otherwise, the notepad, pen, and mug would have never fallen through one of Rick's portals. In Rick and Morty, Rick actually acknowledges that he's a cartoon, which we've covered in another cartoon conspiracy some months earlier. So in a way, these two theories link hand in hand. Is he referring to Rick's world in which Rick has the knowledge of alternate realities? Now keep in mind that alternate realities and alternate universes are one in the same. We only stress this because Rick and Morty tend to use both of these terms interchangeably. The definition of universe is all existing matter and space considered as a whole but maybe they exist in the same multiverse. Rick and Morty plays a lot with the concept of the quantum multiverse. It's a scientific theory in which an individual simply follows one of those many possible paths into their present reality, while all the other paths continue on independent of the person through the incollapsible wave function of quantum mechanics. Each of these paths branches off into an entirely different reality. Now that we got all the science out of the way, let's focus on the theory at hand. So it turns out that Gravity Falls and Rick and Morty don't actually exist in the same dimension. No, Rick actually belongs to dimension C-137. And Ford says that he's in 46 apostrophe forward slash. Whatever that means. <laughs> Whatever that means. 
that. <laughs> but it turns out there's actually a 2D dimension that are in both Gravity Falls and Rick and Morty. So on April 1st, 2015, Alex Hirsch went onto the Gravity Falls subreddit on reddit.com and pretended to be Bill Cipher, answering questions. Username Archive Mode asked, do you know what spawned your existence? Bill answered, Edwin Abbott Abbott has a decent idea. Edwin Abbott Abbott wrote a novel called Flatland, which talks about a fictional two-dimensional world where there is a hierarchy of shapes. Triangles were in the low cast. In Journal 3, Ford stumbles upon a two-dimensional dimension where triangles are also on the low end of the hierarchy. But this dimension can't be Bill's because Bill destroyed his dimension. I find this quite interesting because there's a theory that suggests that Rick actually destroyed his own dimension, C-137. This is suggested through the pilot episode in which it's revealed that Rick has been away for about 20 years. However, in close Rick counters of the Rick kind, we see Rick silently weeping to an image of infant Morty on a screen. Is it possible that this dimension was actually destroyed? Do you think that Rick was actually sad that he destroyed his dimension like Bill was? Bill has a heart? What? According to the Axolotl from Dipper and Mabel and the Curse of the Time Pirates book, he says a poem about Bill. Saw his own dimension burn, Mrs. Homan cannot return. Says he's happy he's a liar, blame the arson for the fire. So it turns out that Bill had all this physical power, but he didn't have the social power to use it, so he decided to destroy his whole dimension. But he didn't want to, he just had to, for his own sake. But Alyssa, what does that mean? Why was Bill on the control panel in Rick and Morty? What does that suggest? Well, I actually have an answer for you from the AMA session. <laughs> During the AMA Reddit session with Bill Cipher, username Pacifica asked, how would a girl like me go about crushing her enemies? And Bill answered, increasing my power is easy and anyone can do it. Just draw my form anywhere in your human world. Each image of me acts as a peephole from my dimension to yours. The more I see, the more I know. The more I know, the greater my power. The greater my power, the more enemies of yours I can crush. Just shake my hand. So putting Bill Cipher's image into Rick and Morty means that he can see into their world. Maybe to watch Rick, maybe so that he can take over their dimension. We don't really know, but Bill has a lot of power and he wants to use it. This theory is a mix of all in good fun and psych, it's the multiverse. We're going to go through the all in good fun aspect of this crossover. Alex Hirsch, the creator of Gravity Falls, and Justin Roiland, the co-creator of Rick and Morty, used to work in a tiny office together for Disney Channel's Fish Hooks. They both dreamed of having their own shows and abusing the power bestowed upon them. Spoiler alert, they did. When that dream became a reality, Hirsch and Roiland decided to put Easter eggs into each other's shows to blow people's minds. When asked if there would ever be an ultimate Rick and Morty and Gravity Falls crossover, Hirsch responded that the winking nods between both shows was just the right balance. Anything else would be portrayed as an annoying cash grab. Now with all that history out of the way, I do believe that art can stand independently from its creators. So it's totally safe to say, and possibly predict, that Ford and Rick's story is not quite finished yet. Although Gravity Falls has ended as a series, we should bring up that Rick and Morty is due for their third season, so a lot could happen. Even if Ford just doesn't pop out of nowhere, Easter eggs are a thing to look out for. Could we learn more about Rick and Ford's relationship in Rick and Morty Season 3? Is the story of Gravity Falls not yet at an end? All in all, this theory does stand very strongly on its own. You can't simply deny that these two worlds can never meet because they clearly have. Here's something that could get you shot by an overzealous fanboy or perhaps even Rick himself. Could it be that Rick isn't actually a genius? Only one way to find out. On December 2nd, 2013, the world was introduced to a show that would change the course of animation forever. On that day, Rick and Morty casually walked into the cartoon dimension and found a very special place in all of our hearts. Who am I kidding? They basically kicked down the door and robbed us of our hearts, but let's be honest, we would have been giving them over willingly. And as we've gotten to know Rick and Morty over the first two seasons, we found that Morty is your average everyday kid and we're taken along with him on his grandfather Rick's adventures. Who, Rick, as we know, is an absolute mad man who can travel through dimensions, build crazy inventions, and speak with one unforgettable pattern, but what if Rick isn't actually a genius? What if his intelligence and who he makes himself out to be isn't who he really is? Maybe, just maybe, he's not that smart. Hey guys, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and you better be taping down your tinfoil hat, because it's time for a cartoon conspiracy. 
you've seen Rick and Morty, you should recall the first episode where, hilariously enough, the first seed is planted. Pun completely intended. At the start of the episode, a drunken Rick pulls Morty out of bed, surprising him with his newest invention. And I want to make a point right here to say that Rick's bottle explicitly has three X's on it, implying that it is alcohol. Keep that in mind. Rick then drags Morty into his newly built spaceship that is, as Rick says, made out of a bunch of stuff in the garage. It seems pretty incredible to have all the necessary parts tucked away in storage, but also the know-how to create it. I mean, like, what a smart guy. But maybe not? Later on, Rick reaches for his trusty flask and takes a sip, but before he does, he passes out, and here is where the theory really starts to kick off. If you notice, every time Rick is drunk, which is like the whole series so far, his drinking container has three X's on it. Always. But the first and every time we see him drinking from his flask, it never has three axes on it. It's just plain, which starts to beg the question, is he really drinking alcohol from this flask? We think not. The episode continues and Rick shows up at Morty's school to let him know that he has to take care of some business. They leave the building and open up a portal that leads to Dimension 35C, which, as Rick says, has the perfect climate condition for a special type of tree, Morty, called the Mega Tree. I was going to do that doing a Rick impression, but... We all know we don't need to see that. And I can't even do a great one, so I'm not even going to have you sit through that. But with all terrible Rick impersonations aside, Rick says there's also fruit in those trees and seeds in those fruits. I'm talking about mega seeds. They're really powerful and I need them for my research. Morty. We can't forget this is Rick talking. Hmm, that sounds like a hint to me, and he needs them for his research. Could this be some kind of special elixir? Rick and Morty get chased around Dimension 35C for a bit until they stumble upon an entire field of mega trees with the mega fruit with the mega seeds inside of them. Morty asks what the seeds do, but Rick is a little reluctant to tell Morty and gives him some special boots as a distraction that allow him to traverse walls and surfaces, which unfortunately, hilariously enough, causes him to break both of his legs. It's a really unfortunate series of events, but if you've seen this episode, you know it's one of the funniest things that has ever happened in the series. So then Rick jumps into another dimension to get broken leg serum, comes back and heals Morty. Morty then climbs up the mega tree and fetches one of the mega fruits containing the very special mega seed. Now here comes the very important part. When Rick is getting the broken leg serum, his interdimensional portal device runs out of charge, making them have to go through interdimensional customs. This is a problem because besides making Morty late and already getting back to school, they now have these crazy mega seeds which are considered some type of contraband and Rick asks Morty to do the very unthinkable. He tells Morty to put those mega seeds way up into his butt. Yeah, I'm not lying about that, I, I wish I was. Why is this butt part so important? Why wouldn't Rick just put them up his own butt? Well, Rick actually says that he's done it too many times so they'll just fall out. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's pretty gross but Definitely keep that in mind. Sorry. So, without going into too much detail there, Rick and Morty make their way through customs get back into their dimension. Morty's parents are mad at Rick for constantly taking Morty along with him on his adventures, and because of this, Morty's grades have seriously dropped. The next scene is extremely crucial to the theory and adds a very interesting layer to it. See, when everyone's arguing about Morty's schoolie and his intelligence, Jerry leans down next to Morty and says, You know what, son? You're just not as fast as the other kids. Wow. This seriously offends Rick, so he steps in and asks Morty what the square root of pi is, and I think you're going to be pretty surprised with the answer. Morty is a little bit reluctant, but he does reply with a 1.77245385 and the first law of thermodynamics. Yeah, pretty crazy stuff. But that kind of does raise a few eyebrows and asks, how does Morty know all this? Is he a super genius like his grandfather Rick before him? Uh, no, not really. It doesn't seem like that because Rick actually jumps in and bursts his bubble by letting him know that temporary super intelligence is just one of the side effects of the mega seeds dissolving in his, you know what. Rick also decides to throw in that once the seeds wear off, Morty is going to lose most of his motor skills and brain functionality for about 72 hours, starting about now. And just as Rick says, it happens. Rick knows the exact feelings and effects of the seeds, which he has admitted to putting up his own butt before. And while all of this crazy stuff is going on, pay attention to the little dribble of spit coming out of Morty's mouth. This looks a little familiar, doesn't it? 
This is actually the exact same little dribble of spit design that the creators use on Rick throughout the entire series, and all of this got us really thinking. So why did I tell you to remember the three X's on the beer bottle, Rick's flask, Rick's butt, the mega seed side effects, and the little spit on both Rick and Morty's mouth? Well, let's take a moment and break this down. As mentioned, Morty has to put the mega seeds in his butt, and the side effect was him being super smart temporarily, but it wore off because he didn't have the mega seeds in him anymore. So what if the same thing is actually happening to Rick. What if Rick isn't actually super smart and he's just relying on this mixture from the seeds to keep his smarts on hand? I mean, Morty even drooled the same way Rick does, and if it were genetics, he would be doing it all the time. It seems like it was a part of the mega seed side effects. Also, remember when I said that every time Rick is getting drunk, whatever he's drinking explicitly has three X's on it? Well, that stays true throughout the entire series. Every container containing alcohol in Rick and Morty is specially marked to let us know that there is is alcohol inside of it, and since Rick is a functioning alcoholic, he carries around his flask to take sips from to get him throughout the day. But hilariously enough, it's not marked, and maybe it's not actually alcohol in his flask after all, but rather a mixture that he created by breaking down the mega seeds and combining them with whatever his drink of choice was at the time. Hmm, it actually does seem pretty likely, because all Rick ever says about the seeds is that they are extremely important to his operation, and he never actually tells Morty or us, or anyone for that matter, why he actually needs the seeds. I mean, they must be pretty important to him if he's going to go this much out of his way to get them and let alone have Morty do all the dirty work. Grandfather of the year over here. And knowing the selfish kind of guy Rick is, I wouldn't be surprised to find out that once he discovered the power of the seeds, this is something that he would latch onto. Anything to really get him to that next step, I could actually see him going through and doing. This all sounds great, right? Like something that would completely check out, but let's just see how this theory stacks up. And during my time of researching this mystery, I tried to see what the general opinion of it was, and for the most part, it seems like everyone's buying into it. Throughout my research of this theory, I was led over to Reddit, where a few Redditors were actually trying to disprove this theory. Reddit user DragonUp56 said, how would he be this smart, pre-seed intellect, to build the portal gun in the first place? It's actually a really interesting point, but another Reddit user by the name of Silvermoon said, nobody said that he wasn't already intelligent. And it's true, the Rick we know from Rick and Morty is already intelligent, but maybe the mega seeds give him an extra boost to some kind of crazy genius level. In my personal opinion, I think that this theory checks out pretty well, and it doesn't have a lot of baggage coming with it, and since it's the very first episode of the series, it could have been laying the grounds for future episodes. As we know, Rick and Morty is the kind of show to break the fourth wall, so there's many different dimensions, and basically anything is possible. Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland are crafting an extremely in-depth and story-heavy world here, and it wouldn't surprise me to find out in the future that these mega seeds were actually part of the plan all along. It's in the pilot, and it's actually the point of the whole episode so it has to serve some kind of purpose, right? I mean, that is the usual pattern with Rick and Morty. A small seed is planted, pun completely intended again, but that seed is planted for later use in future episodes. Maybe in season three we'll see more of this, and perhaps if it's actually canon, there could be a plot line where there's like a shortage of mega seeds and Rick has to survive on his normal amount of intelligence. It seems pretty solid, it seems to make perfect sense, but after hearing some comments by the creators at Comic Con 2016, it seems as though Justin and Dan may have been doing this on purpose all along to just kind of make us all feel smart. They're crafting this insane world of Rick and Morty and they're like, you know what? We're going to lead everyone on. We're just going to place this here. We're going to make it a little bit easy to figure out, but you know what? It's going to be bait. We're building something bigger here. We're just gonna put this little mystery here, this little theory. It's not too crazy to figure out, but we'll let them latch onto that and give them something to chew on as we build this crazy universe. See, according to an article on Digital Times during a Q&A at Comic-Con, one fan actually asked, What's in Rick's flask? Justin Roiland actually responded and said that he thinks that Rick is just a connoisseur of all good liquor. So maybe from day to day, it could be a little bit of Kettle One, some Grey Goose, maybe some Hennessy XO. We don't know what he's got in there. <laughs> but however, a few years earlier, when he was asked the same question in a Reddit AMA, Justin responded with, We're not ready to discuss the contents of Rick's flask yet, hinting that it may or may not be what we think and spawning all these crazy flask theories. You gotta remember that Justin Roiland and Dan and Harmon are the same two dudes that actually just released a Rick and Morty season 3 trailer, but don't get your hopes up because it was actually just a Rick roll. And I actually just got the butt end of the joke. We have Rick Ashley and Rick Sanchez. They're, they're both named Rick. That's the joke. <laughs> 
Ugh, I just, I can't with this show anymore. Anyway, so it's not really a big stretch to think that they're purposely wanting to throw us off, right? But we're just going to have to wait and see, and until that day comes, I'm going to rate this theory three out of five tiny ricks. When you introduce so many different universes, timelines, and more, and have two main characters that are so-called related, well, fan theories can go a little wild. This is one of those theories. Are Rick and Morty the same person? So there's this show that people have been talking about, but I don't think I've ever heard of it. I think it's called Brick and Mortar or something? What is this show? Do people watch this show? Are there theories for this show? All right, so unless you live under a rock, you've probably already heard of Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland's amazing reverse April Fool's prank where they actually premiered season three, episode one of Rick and Morty on the one day we all expected a fake out. Oh, who am I kidding? We've all already seen it. And if you haven't, what? You should. Then you can join the rest of us in wanting McDonald's Szechuan sauce to come back, even though the majority of us probably haven't had it, myself included. The real conspiracy will be whether or not McDonald's chooses to bring it back for next year's Mulan film. But we can look into that at a later date. Because today, we'll be looking at a few other elements of this new episode. Because one or two details have made people take another look at Rick and Morty's relationship. Or should I say, Rick and... Also, Rick, does Morty eventually grow up to become his own grandfather? So this theory seems eerily similar to our Over the Garden Wall Steven Universe theory from the other week. Except the differences here are A, we're only going to be looking through the evidence of one show, and B, that show is Rick and Morty, so it's probably going to be a lot more complicated. So what am I talking about? How could I rationalize that Morty could eventually grow up to become Rick? Well, the idea that Rick and Morty are the same person is an idea that's been floating around since the show's premiere because that seems like something that could happen in a show like this. And there have been some instances in this show that have been pointed to as evidence for this idea. First of all, and most similarly, Rick and Morty are both voiced by Justin Roiland and share similar speech patterns. They both stammer a lot, especially when pronouncing W's. Not to mention that the way they talk has got a somewhat looser feel to it. It's got almost an improvisational tone. But apart from the behind the scenes similarities, there's a lot of other stuff we can look at. For instance, Rick's idea of killing the Rick and Morty of another dimension and taking their place in Rick Potion number nine was significantly more scarring to Morty than it was to Rick. Which implies that Rick has done this many times before. And it could further explain how Rick was able to usurp the role of his own grandfather in the first place. Somewhere far enough down the timeline, Morty slash, let's call our hypothetical Morty who eventually grows up to be Rick, Rick Prime. Rick Prime would just have to murder Morty's original grandfather and then take his place. And from that point, we've only seen alternate universes where this chain of events or something similar already happened. Which is why we've only seen Rick as Morty's grandfather in the central finite curve as opposed to whoever Morty Prime's original grandfather was. But again, moving away from the infinite yet limited amount of universes this show presents us with, the season three premiere also gives us some pretty thought-provoking tidbits as well. In the episode titled The Rick Shank Rick Demption, great naming scheme by the way for all of your episodes, it's a plus. Rick shows Cornvelius Daniel his origin story in great detail, showing us not only a younger, more optimistic Rick, but also his family. In this flashback, Rick mentions offhand that he used to wear blue pants, which in a moment as dire as it was, is a weird thing to focus on. Obviously, it could just be interpreted as a quick gag, acknowledgement of something just drearily mundane in a wild scenario. But some people are taking it as a subtle hint that Rick and a certain other character who wears blue pants might share a bit more in common than we once thought. On top of that, in that same flashback, we're shown one Diane Sanchez, supposedly Rick's wife. And some have pointed out that Diane bears a striking resemblance to someone we've seen in the past. That's right, it's Annie from Anatomy Park. And in a convenient coincidence, Annie is one of the only other characters in the show we've ever seen Morty get particularly close with. However, apart from the obvious, like their different names, there are definitely some problems with assuming that Annie and Diane are the same person. Which we will be getting to soon, so just stay your YouTube commenting fingers for just a couple of minutes. While we're still on the subject of the new episode, there was also one site we were granted when Summer and Morty were brought to the Citadel of Ricks. In the moment they arrive, we see a Morty seemingly unaccompanied by a Rick, but instead dressed as Rick, hair and all. On the surface, this looks like it could once again just be a random visual gag, not unlike the Mortys we see a few seconds later that look like Dipper and Mabel from Grand 
Gravity Falls. But if we take a look at this Morty, his skin tone differs from most of the other Mortys we've met. His skin tone is actually more in line with Rick's, which may suggest that this is actually a young Rick, in the middle of his transition from Morty to Rick. I mean, after all, he is wearing blue pants. I mean, at a surface glance, all of this does kind of make sense to a degree. Rick does have some massive self-loathing issues, which would explain why he's so harsh to Morty. And Morty is clearly on the route to becoming massively desensitized to the unforgiving nature of the multiverse, much like Rick has been for a, as of yet, undisclosed amount of time. But one of the big lasting questions here is how could Morty be so smart to eventually grow up to become Rick? Because Morty's not exactly, uh, how do I put this delicately? naturally gifted. He is Jerry's son, after all. Well, it all comes back again to Season 1, Episode 1. When Rick is convincing Morty to put the Mega Seeds, which grants super intelligence, way up inside his butt, Rick says he can't do it himself because he's done it so many times before that they would just fall out, which just provides some horrifying mental imagery. But if Rick has been smuggling these seeds for as long as he says he's been, could the first time he smuggled them have been when he was younger? When his grandfather convinced him to smuggle them through interdimensional customs? If Morty kept ingesting the mega seeds, it could explain how an older Morty would have the brain capacity to do the things that would eventually lead to him becoming Rick Prime, eventually culminating in him killing his own grandfather and taking his place to set this whole chain of events into motion once again. Did you stay those YouTube commenting fingers? Because right now we're going to talk about the most pressing issue with this theory that I have not addressed yet. Rick's story about himself in the Rick Shank Rick Redemption is revealed to be a complete fabrication. So we can't be sure if any of it was real, or if it was just what Rick projected to make the story seem more convincing. Though since according to Cornvelius Daniel, you're unable to change the details of a memory, it stands to reason that none of what we saw in Rick's flashback was truthful. Of course, in our real world, the details of our memories change all the time, which actually makes our own memories super unreliable. Think back to the earliest memory you ever had. Chances are, it probably never happened. Scary, right? But Cornvelius Daniel's use of the word memory seems to refer less to the subjective view of events of which your perception is constantly changing, but more as a fixed point in time with hard facts that are irrefutable. So based on all that, not only can we not confirm Diane Sanchez's appearance, we can't even confirm that she even existed. We can't even be sure if that's what Rick used to look like. For all we know, he could have been the spitting image of Morty. At this point, any evidence that relates to Rick and Morty being the same person based on this flashback is impossible to confirm or deny. But there is a very heavy skew towards the deny column. The one detail that seems to stick out from this emotionally charged scene is Rick's comment about blue pants. It's such an innocuous thing, why mention it at all? A well-known tactic in Bad Liars is that they'll often try to fill in extra details to make their story seem more believable, when in reality the inclusion of these small details makes the story sound rehearsed. If one of your friends were late to meet you, which one of these excuses would you be more likely to believe? Them saying, Sorry, traffic was brutal. Or them saying, Sorry, I know I took forever, but like, you know, traffic just took a really long time and there was this really old person who was trying to cross the street and they were just taking forever because they had this umbrella that just kept getting caught in the wind and then I was just sitting in my car. We all know exactly what you're doing, Eric, you inconsiderate. Rick, being the subverter of every trope known to man, must be aware of this rookie mistake. So why would he try to force such a meaningless detail as blue pants to make his story more believable to Cornvelius Daniel? That's not the genius Rick we know. Daniel would have believed anything he showed him anyway. So based on these assumptions, which they admittedly are assumptions, he would have to be telling the truth about the blue pants because what would be the purpose otherwise? I'm talking like from a grander story perspective here. What would be the significance? We know that the... I'm gonna call him the Rick Morty from the season three premiere also wears blue pants as well as most other Mortys. But you know who else wears blue pants? A ton of people. In fact, way more than a ton of people. A ton of people is not that many people. Not the least of which both Beth and Jerry. What if Rick and Jerry are the same person? So can we really be confident in saying that Rick's admission that he used to wear blue pants is evidence of him and Morty being the same person? 
Well, not really. Now, moving away from the season premiere, while the whole thing of the speech patterns is a curious similarity within the context of the show's universe, you could just as easily write it off. I mean, Rick and Morty, even if they aren't the same person, are still related after all. And on top of that, when you spend enough time with a certain person, you begin to adopt certain mannerisms from them, which to a large degree includes speech. And of all the people in the family, Rick and Morty definitely spend the most time with each other. So this doesn't actually seem Seem all that weird. As for the mega seed theory, the idea that Morty could use these seeds to further his own intelligence, well, that has its own share of problems. First, since we haven't really seen Morty indulge in these seeds since the pilot, it would mean that any events which would lend him the intelligence to eventually become Rick in the future would have had to have happened after everything we've seen in the series. Which, to be fair, isn't a deal breaker here. We have no idea how long the series will go. That's my series arc, Morty! Hell? If it takes nine seeds, I want my McNugget tipping sauce, about, Szechuan man? sauce, Morty. Okay, well, we have some idea. But maybe after the series run, Morty could start regularly ingesting mega seeds. It could happen. But there's also the matter of the brain ceasing multiple functions after a few hours of the seeds dissolving in Morty's body. It seems like the only way to stop this from happening would be if Rick Prime were constantly drinking the seed juice from some sort of flask or something. If only there was another theory that covered that more in depth. Unfortunately, if the only thing we can turn to substantiate one of our theories is another one of our theories that doesn't really hold water or juice. And with all the talk of Rick and Morty being the same person and a major catalyst in this weird, ridiculous, infinite time loop, I just have another quick point that I need to get off my chest. If this theory is true, my god, how messed up would Rick Prime's family be? Beth would be both his mother and his daughter, Summer would be his sister and his granddaughter, Jerry would still just be Jerry, and Morty would be his own grandfather, like Philip J. Fry. And it would only be slightly less weird than what Fry did to reach the same result. And actually, there is one more thing that makes all of this iffier. And of course, it's timelines because timelines ruin everything. If Morty grew up into Rick Prime, destroyed his own universe through some chain of events, hopped universes like he's previously done in Rick Potion number 9, and then killed his original grandfather to take his place, this causes just a bunch of problems. Why would Rick Prime choose to become Morty's grandfather rather than just killing that universe's version of himself like he's done in the past? How would Rick Prime have convinced Beth that he was actually her father? Maybe he brainwashed her with one of his infinite gadgets? And if he instead did this before Beth was born to sidestep the whole issue, would that universe's Morty even be born to begin with? It's kind of like the dead grandfather paradox. Only instead of going back in time to kill your grandfather, you did it across multiple universes and then took his place. Okay, so it's not entirely the same thing, but depending on how far back in time Rick Prime would have gone in order to accomplish this, it could be comparable. Here's the thing with this theory, as well as a bunch of other theories for this show. Narratives that take place across multiple timelines and universes are absolute beasts. And yet, Rick and Morty manages to keep many elements of its narrative intact, often drawing attention to the particularly important elements, like the Rick and Morty buried in the backyard and the Cronenberg universe. But much of the time, since this show takes place across a massive variety of universes, Rick and Morty seems to take things like timeline issues or time paradox and just adopt its own absurdist philosophy, which is basically, eh, f it, just cause a lot of carnage across multiple universes and don't think about it too much. Nothing really matters anyway, unless it's to serve our own Rick and Morty. This philosophy is even illustrated in Rick's day-to-day -day complete disregard for every other conceivable universe. With the virtually infinite Ricks and Mortys we've seen throughout the series, any consideration of things like timeline paradoxes seems almost laughable. We have practically no choice but to take what we see in the show at face value, and only really deem worth to the slices of continuity that were given. Like the aforementioned Cronenberg universe and Bird Person, I mean Phoenix Person's post credit sequence of the season 3 premiere. Basically, I'm just washing my hands of trying to hard science this show. Please understand. Does that mean there's nothing to be inferred from certain hints we see in the show? Of course not, that Morty dressed like Rick is still a big unanswered question in all of this. But for a great deal of the other evidence in today's theory, there are a few too many holes for us to confidently say that Rick and Morty might actually be a redundant title. With all that in mind, I'm going to rate the plausibility of Rick and Morty being the same person one packet of McDonald's Mulan Szechuan sauce out of five. Remember the Szechuan sauce? Good times.
What if I told you there was more to that sauce than meets the eye though? Get ready for Rick and Morty and the secret of the Szechuan. And yes, I would read that pulp paperback adventure novel. Rick and Morty is one of the biggest cartoons of recent memory. It exploded onto the scene and keeps fans coming back for more and more. The show garnered quite the following with the first two seasons and now people are excited to see what's coming next. And we would all get a taste of that on April 1st, 2017 as Adult Swim ran the very first episode of season three over and over, fooling everyone. Besides the episode blowing away everyone's expectations, there's also something we want to talk about within that first episode of season three. And yeah, that's the Szechuan sauce, which does come from McDonald's. So with that in mind, this week on Cartoon Conspiracy, we want to ask the very interesting question, is Rick and Morty season three, episode one, a subliminal advertisement for McDonald's? As we all know, Rick and Morty is a show that breaks the fourth wall at like every opportunity. Just off of memory, it happens in the pilot episode, Lawnmower Dog, Me Seeks and Destroy, Anatomy Park, Raising Gazorpazorp, Rixty Minutes, and Rixy Business. And that's just season one. Don't even get us started on season two. It happens a lot. We've even done a theory here on Channel Frederator talking about Rick knowing that he's in a cartoon. Yeah, it gets crazy. So this behavior isn't that out of the ordinary, but before we do jump into this theory, let me give you a little backstory on that sauce. Back in 1998, there was a little movie that came out by Disney called Mulan, you might be familiar with it. Well, it came out and McDonald's decided to partner with Disney to promote the movie and their food. They ran advertisements on TV, it was a huge deal, and actually this sauce goes specifically by the name Mulan Szechuan Sauce. The sauce was exclusive to McDonald's, but then left the establishment after the movie left the theaters. The sauce was a success and people really enjoyed it, but we haven't seen it go back into McDonald's since, and usually with things that people like, we see them come back right? So now it's the year 2017 and it's a very different time and advertising is very different now as well. There's the internet and other means to get your products out there. Remember LA Beast championed Crystal Pepsi for years and years and got Pepsi's attention and then they brought it back? Things like that can totally happen. Trends will take off and go viral. And seemingly sometimes for absolutely no reason. I'm sure Richard Dawkins would have a ton to say about this, but honestly, that's for a different time. You take this new way of advertising a product and pair it with Rick and Morty, an absolutely huge show? Well, you're bound to set off a huge internet chain reaction. That's what we think McDonald's has done here with this seemingly forgotten sauce. Let's just think about this. Could Adult Swim and worldwide corporation McDonald's strike a deal together to promote this seemingly forgotten sauce and test the market? If McDonald's randomly brought back this forgotten sauce, it would have suffered one of two fates. The first being the fact that this sauce actually came out a staggering 19 years ago, so people might not remember it. But maybe Disney is somehow involved in this as well, because if you recall just a few months ago, a live action version of Mulan was shown to be in the works. It's completely possible that they're on board as well, and they're all trying to push this product. So besides Rick and Morty, they could be promoting this sauce by other means as well. And the second thing being that it could just be reintroduced to the menu and be as popular or as unpopular as any product on there, which if you think about, seems like a huge risk and gamble to take. So why not take this over the top and crazy route that, if it works, could bring you a lot of success. And as of late, word is that the old company isn't doing as good as they once were. Granted, they're still raking in the cash, but it's nothing like it used to be. So throwing new things at the wall and seeing what sticks could totally be in the cards. Rick and Morty is one of the most popular shows of recent memory, right? These characters in this show are so marketable and just about everything Rick says can be slapped on a shirt and sold for a few bucks, which I'm sure Adult Swim really likes, but I'll be honest, my wallet it really doesn't. So why not have Rick in Rick and Morty, this extremely popular show, take on this new mantra of wanting this sauce and solely seeking out this sauce and having it be his new main mission. Also, we're just going to throw this out there. Spoilers for the newest episode of Rick and Morty. So if you haven't seen it, you've been warned. In season three, episode one, we see Rick tell Cornvelius Daniel about this special sauce while being in a brain link in the past. While being in this brain link and in the past, Rick drives to a McDonald's and gets his hands on this very desirable condiment. Keep in mind that Rick cannot get his hands on this special sauce unless he goes back into the past like he does in this very episode because it's not obtainable in the modern day. While we're going back into the past with Rick in his memory, we see a memory of both his wife and his daughter being killed. Rick actually goes and tells Morty that that wasn't his motivation. His motivation was for that special McNugget sauce. I 
I want that Mulan McNugget sauce, Morty. It's my series arc, even if it takes me nine seasons. This is huge and could prove that the rest of the season is going to serve as a blatant advertisement for the food chain. In this episode, we see Rick have the opportunity to save his wife and his daughter and right the wrongs of his past and interact with a past version of himself, but he doesn't. He trades all of that in just for another taste of this very special and extremely desirable sauce. If you couldn't tell, this episode really builds this sauce up to be like the next big thing. Wow, this sauce is f***ing amazing. You said it was promoting a movie? Rick even goes to crazy lengths to say that this is his series arc. This is what the show is all about. The main character comes out and addresses the audience that this is where things change. The show is going to be completely different from this point forward. He could potentially give his life and die over this sauce. He's willing to do anything for it. Even if it takes him nine seasons, nothing will stop him. In Rick and Morty, we know both of our characters, both our Rick and our Morty, to be from Dimension C-137, right? What if for the rest of the series, or at this point season three because honestly we know Rick to be a guy not to really stick to his guns too much so things can change at any moment. In the rest of season three what if we see Rick trying to bring his message to McDonald's and the actual corporation gets involved with it. So as per usual Rick and Morty go on all kinds of crazy adventures in Dimension C-137 and beyond but do end up at the McDonald's headquarters in their dimension and start to negotiate with the people there. And throughout this entire process somehow Rick convinces McDonald's in Dimension C-137 to bring that sauce back. Sounds cool, right? Rick keeps his promise, he gets his sauce, and he goes to great lengths to achieve it, but what if there is more to this sauce being brought back in the show than what is just being seen at face value? Because let's be honest, Rick and Morty is a show where we think we know what's going on for the most part, but Harmon and Roiland are just constantly laughing at us. What if this confirms that our dimension and the characters in this beloved show share the same universe and dimension of C-137? But what if when this sauce gets brought back in Rick and Morty's dimension C-137, the sauce simultaneously gets brought back in ours. Wouldn't that bridge the gap between both of them confirming that they are the same dimension and we share the same one with Rick and Morty? We think so, and there's actually a lot of positives to this on both sides. Rick gets his hands on the sauce and his main goal in life finally, and for fans of the show, we get to finally taste that sauce that is rumored to be so delicious. And on the other hand, McDonald's gets more people into their establishments, selling food, selling this sauce, making the company more and more money. And the whole time, they just had an underlying deal with Adult Swim and Rick and Morty, the whole time. Animation ain't cheap, and maybe Adult Swim didn't want to keep dumping money into this show, so they asked McDonald's to step on board and fund the rest of it through this underlying promotion. This promotion is so absurd and so so out of this world, it wouldn't seem out of place because that's what Rick and Morty is, right? This all sounds fantastic, right? But let's see how this theory holds up in the breakdown. This theory sounds great, right? But there is one thing that I feel could totally block it. And that's the fact that this show always throws us a curveball as we hinted at in this video. They're constantly throwing crazy stuff in the mix and this really doesn't seem like it wouldn't be in the cards for them. Whenever us fans think that we finally figured out this show, it turns out to be something completely different in the long run. I mean, remember in season two when Mr. Poopy Butthole gets shot and we're like, oh, he's dead, he's gonna die. And then after the credits, he's... He's not. So with all this information gathered, it sounds great, right? But at the same time, it seems a little far-fetched. So at this time, I'm going to give this theory 2.5 Szechuan sauce packets out of five. I'm kind of in the middle of the road and we're just gonna have to see how things develop as the show continues. But hey, that's just what we think and we wanna know, what do you guys think? Leave us a comment in the comment section down below and let us know, did we crack the code to Rick and Morty? Is there more to this theory or is this just completely crazy? Do you think there's crazy stuff going on behind the scenes with this song? Do you think McDonald's has a dog in the race? Keep in mind that there have been advertisements with Rick and Morty in the past, with Carl's Jr. and with Monopoly to bring the classic game to life in a crazy new style. But we want to know what you think, so let us know in the comments below. This one is gonna rock some worlds. What secrets could Pickle Rick be hiding? I thought he was just Rick, but a pickle. But maybe, just maybe, I was wrong. The moment Morty turned him over, Pickle Rick took the world by storm. With season three just on the horizon, Pickle Rick's debut remains highly anticipated by many of the show's fans. At face value, Pickle Rick is just Rick Sanchez as a pickle, the newest Rick iteration since the beloved Tiny Rick. But because we here at Cartoon Conspiracy love to speculate, we wanted to get a head start on the season and ask why. Hey everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and today we're going to dig deep into the mysterious life and times of Pickle Rick. 
For starters, what do we really know about Pickle Rick? Well, we know that he's Rick as a pickle. We know that Morty discovers him in the season three trailer, and we also know that there will be an epic fight scene involving Pickle Rick with insect and rat limbs, the bare bones of which were shown at Comic-Con 2016. And that's, that's really it. It's really not much to go on, but it's so enticing that fans erupted in speculation. Let's start with the basic question. Is this our Rick, Rick C-137? While we don't have any conclusive information, we do see our Morty discovering Pickle Rick in what seems to be safe to assume is Rick C-137's garage so it's incredibly likely that Pickle Rick is simply Rick C-137 in pickle form, just as Tiny Rick was Rick C-137 as a teenager. By the way, notice I'm not referring to our Morty as Morty C-137. That's a conspiracy for another time. Now for a harder question, why a pickle? If Rick was going to steal the body parts of a dead rat, shouldn't he have just become Rat Rick in the first place? Although you have to admit Rat Rick doesn't have the same satisfying ring that Pickle Rick does. And that could be exactly the point. After all, we're talking about the show who gives its characters names like Mr. Poopy Butthole and Principal Vagina. And the show also got Werner Herzog to do a monologue about the human penis. Their entire culture is built around their penises. As intelligent as Rick and Morty is, show Runners Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon have clearly shown a love for the absurd and low brow. The better question from the point of the view of the writers might actually be, why not Pickle Rick? So that's one answer, but don't worry, there's a smarter, more involved one. You see, pickles are acidic because they're, well, they're pickled. We won't go into the exact science of it because don't get us wrong, we hated chemistry just as much as you did. But suffice it to say that acids are great conductors of electricity. The stronger the acid, the better the conductor. Pickles aren't crazy acidic, they're about five on the pH scale. And if you must know, the closer to one, the more acidic something is. So while Lemon Rick could have had some serious electrical power and probably a tie-in with the Earl of Lemon Grab from Adventure Time, in our cartoon version of chemistry, using a pickle would actually enable Rick to send some kind of electrical current from his brain to the limbs that he adds to his pickle body. Yes, this is as ridiculous as it sounds. After all, your normal fleshy body moves thanks to electrical signals. It's dangerously close to faux science, but ta-da! Now the really hard questions. Where is Rick in the Comic-Con clip? What is he doing and why is something as small and innocuous as a pickle the best method of accomplishing whatever he needs to get done? Granted, this is Rick Sanchez we're talking about. I have a few rather spoilerific hunches on this one, so you've been warned and hear me out. Rick could be taking a smaller, sneakier, faster form in order to stage a prison break and releasing all the ex-Galactic Federation's prisoners just to increase pandemonium across the multiverse seems like a very Rick thing to do. Or he could specifically be hoping to break out good old Squanchy. We don't really know what happened to Squanchy after the epic fight in the season 2 finale, but I would have to guess he's probably tied to one of those depressing platforms. However, given that the Galactic Federation collapses in the first episode of season 3, it's rather likely that the prisoners have already been busted from the inside out. But the more intriguing reason for the existence of Pickle Rick still lies with the season 2 finale. What if Rick is hunting down Tammy and in the rat clip has broken into her very secret looking, very high tech looking stronghold that was teased at the end of Season 3, Episode 1. Why? To bust out Phoenix Person, of course. Actually, you know, I, I take that back. I wouldn't traipse into a villainous lair with a body as a small pickle if you were planning on some righteous friend napping. However, you might desire a significantly smaller body if you were doing some recon. We think Rick could be spying on Tammy using his pickle bod to gather information about her, who she works for, what her motivations are, and most importantly, what her weaknesses are. Because Rick is probably hungry for some delicious revenge after that red wedding. Well, yeah, not that red wedding, but you get what I mean. We have no reason to believe that Rick has any reason to believe that Bird Person is still alive or some version of Bird Person. Anyway, I mean, I certainly didn't see Phoenix Person coming, but then again, Rick has outsmarted me multiple times through the television. But this theory also relies on Rick having uh, tender emotions and fierce loyalty. Rick's supposed emotional weak spots have popped up unexpectedly throughout the show, and it's been hinted for a long time that Rick might actually feel for his family and close friends, a list which seems to end in Bird Person and Squanchy. But Rick Rick's emotional vulnerability is something you should never count on, like ever. Morty's learned that the hard way several times. In the end, I think the theory that Rick might have shrunken himself into an electrically conductive pickle to get revenge for Bird Person sounds... That sounds pretty reasonable. And honestly, I'd give this theory four blips and shits tickets out of five. Or you know, it could be a type of legume based bat signal for an epic merging of Rick and Morty and VeggieTales. That's the one that I want, please. Give us that. I can't be the only one that'd want to see Bob the Tomato and Morty have to deal with Rick and Larry in the same room. That just sounds ridiculous. I know I'm not the only one that's wanted that for quite some time. If you actually research online, there's so many people dying for that crossover. Actually, 
it's just, it's just me. For what reason? I, I don't even know. I mean, in Rick and Morty, we have Rick as a pickle and him talking about McDonald's sauce. So at this point, anything seems to be game. Ever wonder how evil Morty came to be? Sure, it's always fun to have an alter ego for your main characters, but what happened in their life to make it all go so wrong? Let's see if we can figure that out with Evil Morty's origin story. I don't need to reintroduce Rick and Morty, right? Adult Swim Show, created by Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland, crazy interdimensional travels, we're all on the same page here, right? So as you may recall, we've taken a look at, uh, a handful of theories that cover the spectrum of just how chaotic this show can be. But among all of them, there is one theory that's worth revisiting with the upcoming season. And that's concerning the identity of the evil Morty in close Rick counters of the Rick kind. He was quite the departure from the general idea of Morty that we've come to accept. But other than a Morty, obviously, who is this? What could his intentions be? And most importantly, will he finally make his return in season three? So, because this is Rick and Morty, and because a lot of details can get lost in the shuffle, let's approach this pragmatically and first establish everything that we know. And let's start with what we can infer from the one, the only, Evil Morty. Or Eye Patch Morty, as some people call him for... I don't know, some stupid reason. It's in Close Rick Counters where it's revealed that Evil Morty was actually remotely controlling Evil Rick, so we can pretty much discount Evil Rick entirely and attribute all of his words and actions to Evil Morty. However, we can also be pretty confident in saying that Evil Morty and Evil Rick probably don't share any other connection. You know, like Evil Morty being Evil Rick's... Morty. How can we be so sure? There are a couple of reasons, but most prevalent is that Evil Morty appeared to view Evil Rick as just means to an end. Also, because of the blending in with the Rickless Mortys, we can be confident in saying that Evil Morty is a Rickless Morty and has been one for quite some time. Since Mortys are a virtually infinite resource to Ricks, there isn't really any reason for most Ricks to pursue a Morty for too long before giving up and reapplying for a new Morty to be assigned to them. But notice how I said, most Ricks? Well, that's because there's at least one Rick that may care more about Morty than he actually lets on. And that's our hero, good old Rick from Dimension C-137. On second thought, good old is really not the descriptor I should be using for him. So we know that C-137 Rick cares a mite more about his Morty than a lot of other Ricks do since he tears up at viewing memories of Morty in close Rick counters. But he also seems to be the Rick who is the most uncompromising in his beliefs when compared to all of the Ricks in the central finite curve, with his tenuous relationship with the Council of Ricks being the primary source for that claim insert clip of the Council of Ricks being destroyed by C-137 Rick here. But even at the end of Close Rick Counters, Rick doesn't grant Morty any sort of positive reinforcement as he doesn't believe Morty will gain anything from it. Further illustrating just how set in his ways that Rick is, whether others like it or not. So with that preliminary information in mind, we're next going to establish what I'm going to call the Rick and Morty relative alignment spectrum, or Ram Ramras for short although we're probably never going to call it that. We'll be referring to this chart throughout this video to hopefully give us a bit of insight on the nature of different iterations of Rick and Morty. As revealed once again in Close Rick Counters, Ricks use Mortys as camouflage. This is because their brainwave patterns perfectly cancel each other out, effectively making them diametrically opposed foes. And based on Rick and Morty's conversations in Close Rick Counters, their two respective defining character traits seem to be related to intelligence and empathy. We can relatively easily place most incarnations of Rick and Morty on a four-way spectrum consisting of these two axes. On the x-axis, we have a spectrum ranging from Rick's super intelligence to Morty's Morty brainwaves, while on the y-axis, we have Morty's empathy at the top and Rick's cold, uncompromising outlook at the bottom. Obviously, given the infinite possibilities of Rick and Morty, a study of a a couple dozen Ricks and Mortys would probably result in a scatter plot that looks something like this. But there are a few extremes that may be important to figuring out who exactly Evil Morty could be. Firstly, in the bottom right, the most uncompromising and the most intelligent, the Rickest Rick, is arguably our good friend C-137 Rick. If for no other reason than he self-identified himself as the Rickest Rick in Rick Counters. Perfect. And just as Rick says, it should go without saying that the Rickest Rick should have the Mortiest Morty. So we can place the Morty we follow through most of the show at the opposite extreme, possessing the standard Morty waves as well as displaying the most empathy of all Mortys. And just to quickly fill out the other extremes, the oddest Rick out that we've met so far would obviously be the Rick from Universe J19Zeta7, who we'll from now on just refer to as Doofus Rick. After all, he's a total outcast from all of the other Ricks for seemingly no other reason than he's just more empathetic to other people, especially Jerry, which 
Like, why? No wonder he's weird. But since Doofus Rick appears to, oddly, still be a genius capable of interdimensional travel, he's still intelligent, which would comfortably place him in the top right corner, earning the title of the Mortiest Rick. As for our missing corner here, seems like a cold, uncompromising Morty who still possessed a Morty brainwave pattern would fit comfortably there. So are we good to assume that evil Morty is in fact the Rickest Morty? And before we go any further, yes, I'm aware of how problematic this chart can be for a show whose core concept is about infinite parallel universes. But the show doesn't seem to concern itself much with this problem, so we won't either. Yes, there are practically infinite Ricks, but for all intents and purposes, there has to be a limit. After all, we still don't even know what the limitations of the central finite curve even are, so there's no sense dwelling on it. Okay, with all of this preliminary stuff taken care of, let's get to some theories about Evil Morty. Three of them, to be exact. And from there, we might be able to determine if Evil Morty is poised to come back in Season 3. Okay, we're a bit all over the place right now, but before we dive any deeper, it's important to keep in mind that taking literally anything in Rick and Morty at face value is kind of an exercise in futility. So all we can really do is speculate. Alright, now with that in mind, let's get rolling. First up, one theory that surfaced is that Evil Morty could actually be Doofus Rick's Morty, given how completely opposite they are to both each other, as well as our general perception of Rick and Morty, this seems like a pretty good idea. And that's not even factoring in that both characters were introduced in the same episode. And if we refer to the Ramraz, Oh my god, we actually used the name. Seems like Evil Morty and Doofus Rick would cancel each other out and fill out the main four corners of our spectrum, so slam dunk, right? Well, no. It never is, you should know this by now. The massive problem with this is that Doofus Rick mentions to Jerry that he never had any kids. And to counter this, some fans have theorized that just as Doofus Rick is a Rick without a Morty, maybe Evil Morty is a Morty without a Rick. But that's more difficult to justify because that's not how time or genetics works. Not every Rick needs a Morty, but every Morty would probably need a Rick. I mean, unless they were a clone, in which case this theory could still work, but that's a whole other can of worms that we honestly don't have time for today. Another idea concerning Doofus Rick is that maybe he and Evil Morty were originally a normal Rick and Morty who had their consciousness swapped for some unspecified reason, most likely to hide Rick from the Council of Ricks. After all, what better Morty camouflage is there other than actually being a Morty? And as of the Rickshank Rickdemption, we know that this technology exists and can be used without any ill effects. So it's definitely an interesting idea. However, it doesn't quite explain a lot of things. Like why Evil Morty feels that he needs to kill other Ricks to gain power. Or why Doofus Rick, if he's a Morty in the body of a Rick, would decide to continue this act long after he was abandoned by Evil Morty. And that's under very little scrutiny. Given more time, there's probably a lot more threads that don't quite add up. Next up, we have the theory that regardless of who Evil Morty is, he set off on a Rick killing rampage in order to free other Mortys of the oppression that they endure. And honestly, regardless of who Evil Morty is, that's not the craziest idea. For the purposes of this theory, it doesn't really matter who Evil Morty originally belonged to, but regardless, it would serve to make any other theory about Evil Morty way more interesting. Also, funnily enough, Evil Morty would essentially be setting himself up as the savior of the Church of the Good Morty, being the one Morty to rise up and deliver all Mortys from their oppressors. If he were to lead a revolution against the Ricks, it would stand to reason that all followers of the religion would rally behind him. Look at how quickly they stood behind the Morty we follow throughout the show in close Rick counters. However, if this were the case, Evil Morty doesn't seem to have any problem oppressing other Mortys as long as it's for his benefit. Case in point, the protective wall of Mortys. Granted, puppeteering a Rick throughout Rick counters would require him to employ some diabolical Rick-like tactics, but it's still a point worth mentioning. Though it can be easily waved away by, well, you know, he was undercover. You can't make a god complex omelet without breaking a few Mortys. I just realized I was super mocking there, but you could actually wave all of that away with that exact logic. But finally, we're going to examine one more theory which has a bit more for us to bite into, and this is that Evil Morty is actually C-137 Rick's original Morty. But notice how I'm not saying that he's Morty C-137? This is because Rick's original Morty is not C-137 Morty. By the way, if this theory sounds familiar, it's because we've briefly looked at it before in an earlier cartoon conspiracy. But there are some additional details that make this theory a bit meatier that we're going to take a 
look at right now. We never hear our Morty mention anything about originating from a dimension that was anything other than the now Cronenberg C-137. And usurping the positions of the Rick and Morty of the dimension that they currently occupy was pretty scarring to him. So seeing as these all seem to be new experiences for him, this would make our Morty unquestionably C-137 Morty. As we know, since Beth has mentioned it no less than 400 times, Rick left her family quite some time ago before recently coming back. Most fans have come to accept that Rick was gone for about 20 years, but it's never specifically stated in the show. Though we can definitely assume that it's longer than Morty has been alive. So we have all of this time in Rick's life that's just unaccounted for. So, and here's the million dollar question, what was he doing? Actually, let's answer that question with another question. How did Evil Morty get to be so intelligent? 99.9% .9 of all other Mortys his age are of about the same intelligence. That is to say, nowhere near Rick's ability. But Evil Morty is consistently way more clever than normal. And how else could this be accomplished unless he, at one point, spent an inordinate amount of time with a Rick who taught him from a very young age? And I forget, which Rick has very vivid memories of a young Morty again? Oh, that's right, C-137 Rick. Not to mention the photo of Rick holding a baby Morty in Bird Person's home. So let's entertain this thought just a little bit longer. Let's assume that C-137 Rick actually raised his original Morty, but then screwed the kid up, causing him to then return to Dimension C-137 to raise his... original... Morty? Wait a minute, that doesn't make sense. Unless, of course, C-137 Rick isn't actually from Dimension C-137. By turning our thinking around, may I present to you the best possible. No, I immediately retract that. I don't want that kind of pressure. A possible explanation for the origins of Evil Morty. Meticulously crafted from some evidence, assumption, and a lot of speculation. In an unknown dimension, Dimension X, our Rick, C-137 Rick, raises his original Morty to be just like himself, but goes a little too far. Over the course of several years, this young Morty is slowly corrupted and eventually desensitized to all aspects of interdimensional travel, including the disposability of Mortys themselves. This, combined with the intelligence gain, displaces this Morty from the natural order and makes him essentially equal with our Rick, and that's a situation which obviously won't end well. This Morty, now Evil Morty, inevitably turns on Rick, which results in the two parting ways under less than amicable terms. Rick flees to a dimension in which Beth's father left and died, or left and never returned, to assume the role of that universe's Rick to try all over again with a fresh new Morty. And this dimension is Dimension C-137. C-137 could be a dimension in which the original C-137 Rick had already died, leaving our Rick to take his place. Like in Rick Potion number 9. Based on his actions in that episode, it seems like he's done this before. This would explain why Rick still pushes more Morty to chase scientific pursuits. Rick may have screwed up with his original Morty, but he uses these mistakes to teach a new Morty more responsibly. It's slightly more responsibly. It also explains a couple of other niggling questions, like why exactly Evil Morty would go after C-137 Rick in the first place. I know he says it's because of his evil factor in his evil database so that he can kill him and then gain his knowledge, but honestly, just vengeance for his mistreatment of his original Morty is more than an acceptable motive. After all, we do see a memory of a Morty being electrified who could very well be Rick's original Morty, so it's not like C-137 Rick's hands are clean, really. It would also explain Rick's welling up when he sees his memories of baby Morty. Rick's not one to admit his regrets easily, but this would definitely be something he could feel genuine remorse for. And finally, the biggest piece of evidence that links C-137 Rick to evil Morty is the exchange held at the end of Rick Counters. Rick tells Morty not to let anything get to his head, because a Morty that gets too cocky can cause problems and be a real bad thing for everybody. On top of Rick sounding like he was speaking from experience, he also tells Morty that he'll explain more when he's older. From there, the episode cuts to literally what Evil Morty was doing. Basic film language would dictate that ending a scene on an unanswered question and then cutting to a seemingly unrelated scene would denote meaning between the two. A cut like that generally foreshadows or implies a connection between the two events. Granted, with Harmon and Roiland at the helm here, they could be intentionally burying the lead because that's what they do, but traditional conventions do support C-137 Rick and Evil Morty having a strong connection. 
connection. Based on the evidence we've seen, it looks like Evil Morty being C-137 Rick's original Morty would be the most likely and most dramatic answer to who exactly Evil Morty is. As for whether he'll return in Season 3, with just how much from the past was called back to in the first episode of Season 3, like Phoenix Person and the Cronenberg universe, it looks like Season 3 will largely be a season for revisiting unresolved plot threads. And Evil Morty is one of the biggest, so I would rate the plausibility of Evil Morty revealing himself to be C-137 Rick's original Morty and returning this season 3.5 vouchers for a free replacement Morty out of 5. You want more Evil Morty theories? Well, alright, but only because you asked so nicely. A couple of weeks ago on Cartoon Conspiracy, we found ourselves diving into Rick and Morty's The Ricklantis mix-up to dissect the bubbling tension within the Citadel of Rick's as well as the oppressive environment therein. And today, we're bringing you what is pretty much part two of this theory. And while we are going to revisit some discussion about the Citadel, our main focus today, of course, is our boy, Evil Morty. By the way, this is a Rick and Morty episode, so if you still somehow aren't caught up on Rick and Morty, there are going to be some pretty major season three spoilers in this video. But yes, since we last took a look at the perpetual mystery that is Evil Morty, not only has he returned, but he's also become the new democratically elected leader of the Citadel of Rick's, which is a interesting path for Evil Morty to take. I think we can safely say none of us were expecting this moment, especially since it was kind of just shoved into the middle of the season as opposed to leaving it at the end for some sort of epic, mind-blown cliffhanger thing. But while that reveal was pretty shocking, it's kind of hard to know what to think about it, since we know so little about Evil Morty, much less his M.O. or his end goal. So today, that's what we're gonna try to figure out. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and let's examine the enigma that is the inner machinations of Evil Morty's mind to figure out what exactly is his plan for the Citadel of Ricks. Let's first take a look at Evil Morty within the context of the show as a whole, as well as within the context of the Ricklantis mix-up. And from there, we'll dig a little deeper into his plans. One of the overall themes of Season 3, driven home by the season finale, seems to be what Rick has been saying since the very beginning. Which is that A, nothing matters, and B, the answer to whatever question you have is don't think about it. With Season 3 stretching to re-establish the status quo that Seasons 1 and 2 seem to be edging away from. While it doesn't completely discount some of the unanswered questions of the show, it's quick to remind us that once Rick explained his philosophy to Beth, the fact that Beth used her choice to embrace what she already has is just as valid as Rick's disdain and apathy towards the same situation. Any satisfaction we may take from our lives or the choices that we make is directly dependent on how we choose to perceive them. Which honestly could also say a lot about how Rick and Morty is received by the public as a whole. But of course, that's not gonna fly with us today. While this show definitely plays fast and loose with the idea of continuity, the show absolutely maintains little vertical slices of story that we're constantly reminded of. Things like Tammy's role, Phoenix Person, who is currently MIA, the Cronenberg C-137 universe, and of course, the Citadel of Ricks. So as we take a look at the Ricklantis mix-up, let's examine Evil Morty through a few different lenses. First, how did he gain his popularity? Second, what were his immediate actions upon gaining power? And third, could knowing Evil Morty's ideology allow us to better understand his actions? And before we get started, it's worth noting that Evil Morty's actions may or may not be tied to his true identity. And while we did come to the conclusion that Evil Morty could be the Rick that we follow throughout the show's original Morty, this has never been confirmed, so we're going to sidestep this for now. For all intents and purposes today, Evil Morty is just a Rickless Morty with an unknown agenda. So how was Evil Morty able to use the Citadel's politically fragile state to his own advantage? Well, what does that even mean? In what way could the Citadel be considered politically fragile? Firstly, it seems like Evil Morty's most fundamental step in his playbook is to cater to those who are marginalized by the rest of society. Mortys are often seen as second-class citizens and have a pretty strong bias against them in the Citadel, as evidenced by one of the Citadel's primary news sources openly mocking the Morty Party at the beginning of the episode. The newscasters vastly underestimate the Morty Party's potential, going so far as to insinuate that Evil Morty looks a adorable simply playing politics as opposed to posing an actual threat. Another factor of Evil Morty's strategy can be seen on the whiteboard behind the initial conversation between Evil Morty and his campaign manager. We see a whiteboard that cites Divided Citadel as an aspect of the Morty advantage. So it seems like a big part of Evil Morty's strategy is to also cater to those Ricks who feel marginalized by other Ricks who are placed higher in the social hierarchy for seemingly arbitrary frivolous reasons. Evil Morty also appears to be the only candidate who brings up the 
the issue of the Citadel facing a systemic problem from the top down, rather than the other way around, as most Ricks seem content to see the issue. While the majority of Ricks see their society crumbling because of vagrant homeless Mortys and disgruntled Ricks, Evil Morty brings to light that these are all symptomatic of the real problem, which is those at the top who are content with the current system that, whether it means to or not, only strengthens the divide between the disenfranchised and the entitled. And Evil Morty takes it upon himself to be that voice for the voiceless. He tells the metaphorical 1% that their days are numbered, and the revolution is coming for them. D democratically, he means for now. And like we mentioned a few weeks ago, there's also the factor that the Citadel is an absolutely soul-crushing environment. On top of all the systemic problems already mentioned, this is a world where the feeling of toppling the oppressive machine is itself branded, packaged, and sold as a commodity. This is a world where the mystique of a Morty throwing himself into a wishing portal in the fleeting hope of things improving is immediately ripped away with the reveal that the portal is just a garbage dump. Even if Slick Morty's wish did kind of come true, the reality check we're given seemingly robs his message of its meaning. This kind of environment would also play to those who felt abandoned by the system, and they would probably become more willing to do something to impart actual change. Do something to actually disrupt the system, as opposed to buying that feeling through simple ricks. Do something like vote for a fringe political candidate. As we all know, in the world of politics, talk is cheap. Words are just words, and speeches are for campaigning. And once Evil Morty wins the election, now is the time for action. I just spilled water everywhere. But even before his odd anti-monologue, we do see some changes take effect as a direct result of Evil Morty winning the election, so... What happens? Well, firstly, the new Citadel's codes apparently absolve Cop Rick of everything he did, from being caught up in the warring gangs of Morty Town to killing his own partner. His own partner, a Morty who believed himself to be freer than most other Mortys by leaning into the oppressive nature of the Citadel. But in the end, his own brash outlook of Mortys being the underlying problem of the Citadel eventually caused his downfall. Same old story. Rick's killing Mortys. Evil Morty also immediately abandons the curriculum of the unnamed Morty reform school that we see throughout the episode. And while a rework of the classes is hinted at, all we know right now is that it doesn't seem like these Mortys are going to be assigned any new Ricks anytime soon. And of course, the last thing we see Evil Morty do in this episode is immediately execute all of his dissenters in the Citadel's shadow government as a show of force, which is an interesting detail. In a lot of democratic societies, there are those, you know, actual real conspiracy theorists that suggest that either the country or the world or the universe is actually governed by some sort of ominous shadow government. Which would of course mean that whoever was elected into office doesn't have any actual real power. In the Ricklantis mix-up, this is shown to be 100% entirely the case, even when the Citadel of Ricks was purportedly run by the Council of Ricks. But with Evil Morty's actions at the end of the episode, he is left as the singular, unequivocal ruler of the Citadel. So based on these actions, coupled with his rise to power, can we pin down Evil Morty with any sort of ideology? It's uh, actually a little bit more difficult to do than it seems at first glance since the actual political platforms of each party in the episode aren't very well defined, especially within the Ricks. But in any case, let's see what we can uncover. First off, the rigid class system within the Citadel pretty much uses Mortys as shorthand for the idea of systemic discrimination present in many societies. There's even a short scene where the Mortys are throwing a pride parade to hammer this home. Evil Morty plays not only to these oppressed Mortys, but also to the downtrodden Ricks. Acting as a voice for the common folk who will unite to displace the bourgeois ricks from their ivory towers. Now, this sort of populist political movement wherein politicians mess with the current social order in the supposed interest of the common people is nothing new. This sort of strategy has been in play for pretty much as long as democratic elections have been. All the way from the disruptiveness of Roman Tribune Publius Claudius Pulcher in the first century BCE, all the way to how populism's marriage with identity politics created symbols on all sides of the political spectrum in last year's presidential election. But that's not where it ends with Evil Morty. While his campaign claims to be for the people, this all seems to dissolve when you actually look at it closely. As we've seen before, while he does choose to be the voice for all of these abandoned Mortys, he's not exactly above exploiting them himself. And I'm not talking about political exploitation. In close encounters, he literally tortures hundreds, thousands of Mortys in order to cloak himself from the Citadel, as well as the Rick that we follow throughout the show. So it seems fair to say that Evil Morty doesn't exactly help out his own kind through any sort of empathy. Everything and everyone exists solely to progress his 
unknown Machiavellian agenda. Evil Morty seems intent right now more than anything else to be the sole undisputed leader of the Citadel. And that actually segues us pretty neatly into the dreaded topic of fascism. Fascism, in its colloquial definition, generally involves practices like silencing dissenters and autocratic dictatorships. Of course, there are way, way more defining characteristics, but these are just a few of them. Fascism is a big umbrella term that encompasses a lot of stuff that we frankly don't have time for today. But even based on those two things that we looked at, Evil Morty seems to be well on his way to establishing some sort of authoritarian dictatorship. Based on his first immediate acts when taking the office of president that didn't seem to be subject for any approval, as well as his murder of the shadow government, yeah, that seems to be where we're going with this. Not only that, but going back to the whiteboard during Evil Morty's campaign, we can see a note that lists alternative news sources as another aspect of the Morty advantage, with alternative noticeably in quotation marks. Now, to be fair, there are a few different ways we can interpret that. I mean, we could give Evil Morty the benefit of the doubt and say that he's planning some sort of huge, brand new, unbiased news network. But within dictatorships, the silencing or restriction of certain news media outlets in favor of those that are more acceptable sources is a well-known practice. This strategy, again, has been used throughout history, but it's still used in parts of the world today within certain states that value propaganda above all else. So could Evil Morty's plan for alternative news sources include shutting down the Rick-centric news present in the Citadel in favor of anti-Rick propaganda? But with all of this talk of Evil Morty's ideology and fashion, Fascism, there is one rather large issue. Fascist leaders typically gain power through a rise in rampant nationalism, something that the Citadel should be uniquely free of. What other powers would the Citadel feel the need to feel superior to? There don't seem to be any wavering tensions between the Citadel or any countries or planets or universes or any governing bodies at all. Heck, the whole point of the Citadel is to hide Ricks from all other governing bodies. The Citadel, for the moment, doesn't even seem all that concerned with the Rick that we follow throughout the show. Even though the last time they crossed paths with him, he took the whole place down. So without a common enemy for the entirety of the Citadel to unite against, what's Evil Morty's plan now? So here's the million dollar question. Why the Citadel? What does Evil Morty have to gain by running the Citadel of Ricks? He seemed to be doing just fine on his own. Well, many theories still hold steadfast that this is all a plan to get back at the Rick that we follow throughout the show, which would make sense if he is indeed our Rick's original Morty. And yes, at first glance, this idea may seem a tad overly simplistic. But Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland seem to revel in subversion, so this idea is totally still on the table. That said, it still does have its share of small problems. While it's true that Evil Morty might have a better chance at locating our Rick with the Citadel's resources backing him up, Evil Morty has already been face to face with our Rick. From there, it would seem relatively easy for him to find a way to track our Rick, right? It's a leap in logic, but Evil Morty has more than proven his capability to create a tracking device of that caliber. Furthermore, when Evil Morty actually had our Rick in his clutches, he didn't seem that intent on killing him, despite whatever Evil Rick was actually saying. Knowing how Rick thinks, if he really wanted our Rick dead, he would have spared the theatrics and just done it. So assuming that Evil Morty's goal isn't to exact revenge on our Rick, what are we left with? Well, a common theory about Evil Morty is that the influx of Rickless Mortys in Morty Town and the Morty School is a direct result of the events in close Rick counters of the Rick kind, which would mean that the political unrest that we see in the Citadel would have been a long, calculated con by Evil Morty, stacking the deck in his favor by increasing the Morty population right under the nose of the entire Citadel before the political race even began. Now, ignoring the issue that Evil Morty would have had to have started this long before the Citadel ever became a democracy, why would he feel the need to increase his political power through these displaced Mortys? Based on what we've seen, upending the previous power dynamic was a pretty high priority of Evil Morty. Could Evil Morty's intention simply be to elevate the status of Mortys within the eyes of all Ricks and Mortys? Abandoning the notion that Mortys are forever bound to be the sidekicks of Ricks, a common theme found in the Ricklantis mix-up? Finally, realizing Mortys as their own individuals? Maybe we've been looking at this all wrong. After all, evil is a subjective term. Looking at things from an unbiased perspective, evil Morty doesn't seem that much worse than the Rick that we follow throughout the show, in that they're both horrible people. I'm not saying that evil Morty is a saint or anything. But keep in mind, the reason we call him evil is not necessarily because he's evil, it's just because he's an antagonist to our Rick. Besides, evil Morty's actions might actually be a little less extreme than our 
Rick. Yes, he may have murdered Ricks and exploited Mortys to climb the political ladder in a reprehensible display of the ends justifying the means, but so far he still seems at least somewhat intent on pushing some sort of social reform with his newfound political power. And then we have our Rick, who murdered just about everyone in the Citadel before outright destroying the whole thing, as well as the entire economy of the Galactic Federation as means to, above all else, separate Beth from Jerry. Not to mention it was also all in pursuit of that damned Szechuan sauce. When comparing the two, it seems like Evil Morty has a much more structured plan for social reform within the Citadel compared to Rick's general apathy towards literally everything. Evil Morty just happened to go about all of this in one of the most objectively evil ways imaginable. You could probably even make the argument that Evil Morty could be an extension of the dilemma Beth faced in the ABCs of Beth. When faced with how to utilize the opportunities you're given, is it better to make any choice, as Evil Morty does, or no choice, as our Rick seems committed to? Of course, there are issues with this idea, like campaign manager Morty insisting that Evil Morty is up to something much more sinister, as well as the reason for absorbing solving Cop Rick of his crimes. I mean, we could speculate that Evil Morty is planning on running the Citadel in a sort of Caesarist fashion, ruling with an iron fist, promoting a violent social order, and pardoning Cop Rick for purging the streets of Mortys who only encourage their negative stereotype. It's all possible, but with the vast amount of unanswered questions, this is all just a projection of what could be. Good God, the Rick Lantis mix-up is so dense. Every single image has so many things going on. But with everything we've taken a look at today, there are so many unanswered questions about Evil Morty and his plans with regards to the marginalized population of the city as well as the Rick that we follow throughout the show. And since we didn't really enter this episode with a hypothesis in mind, we can't really assign this conspiracy a rating, so this week, I'm gonna leave it up to you. How many envelopes filled with secrets out of five do you rate our conclusion that Evil Morty might actually just be looking for equality for Mortys? Do you think that Evil Morty's plans could be something different? Does the name Morty even mean anything anymore? I've said Morty hundreds of times this week. It's, it's just a collection of sounds now. Mr. Poopy Butthole is one of the deepest, most meaningful, most unbelievably complex characters to ever grace our screens. But what if he wasn't what he seemed? What if Mr. Poopy Butthole was an evil parasite? Rick and Morty is a show ripe with unanswered questions. Who is evil Morty? Is our Morty really Rick C-137's original Morty? What's Rick's backstory and why is Jerry such a loser? But of all these nagging questions, there's an old one from season one that still has fans scratching their heads. Just who and what is Mr. Poopy Butthole? And with the memorable cameo of Noob Noob in The Vindicators, a new question arose. Is there a whole species of poopy buttholes we should know about? Hey everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator and today we're going to be talking about everyone's favorite poopy butthole. But let's start at the beginning, and yes, there will be spoilers if you haven't seen the season 2 episode, Total Recall, which to be honest is kind of on you because why are you even watching conspiracy videos without seeing one of the finest Rick and Morty episodes of all time? So just pause the video and watch it. I can wait. I, I'll wait. Just kidding, you know, I'm not waiting at all. Here we go. Total Recall begins with the Smith family eating breakfast with an Uncle Steve we've never really seen before, but they all seem very similar with. Rick shoots Steve in the head and reveals that he's an alien parasite, a creature who inserts itself into your memories. The parasites multiply when anyone flashes back, inserting themselves into a newly fabricated memory that you now think are real. Kinda of freaky, huh? Right after Rick's explanation, Mr. Poopy Butthole appears, seemingly out of thin air. All of a sudden, he's in every scene in the opening credits as well, so I know what you're thinking, because I thought it too. Parasite, right? After every other parasite is eradicated at the end of the episode, Beth came to that same conclusion, but when she shoots Mr. Poopy Butthole, no parasite appears. Instead, there's blood. Real blood, and, and lots of it. What? And with that, you can't write Mr. Poopy Butthole off as a one episode wonder because he appears at the end of season two, living in his own apartment with his cat, chugging painkillers for his still healing gunshot wound, and watching Rick and Morty, hilariously enough, just like us. Of course, this topic has been long beaten to death on the interwebs, but one popular theory was that Total Recall takes place in another dimension 
with another set of the Smith family. But recently, Justin Roiland pointed out that you can actually see where the alien parasites came from two episodes beforehand in Morty Night Run. While Morty leaves to say goodbye to Fart, Rick is loading green rocks into his ship, the same rocks he's throwing away in the beginning of Total Rick Hall. And ta-da! When Rick loads them, you can see they're infested with little pink parasite pods. Roiland specifically put this in as an intrinsic proof that Total Rick Hall does not take place in an alternate universe. Smart guy. But just because the episode itself doesn't take place in an alternate dimension, doesn't mean that Mr. Poopy Butthole can't be a multi-dimensional creature. After all, how the bejeebers could he be watching Rick and Morty if he was still inhabiting Rick's C-137 dimension? Weird. I'm assuming Rick and Morty doesn't air in Rick and Morty's actual dimension, but given how excited Rick seems to get when he sees himself on TV, I feel like we would have definitely known that by now. But I'm going to stop pretending like this is an original idea. Dan Harmon himself threw this theory out earlier this year. Quote, how about wherever these parasites start blooming, Mr. Poopy Butthole is a different species who is more benign or more advanced. Maybe Mr. Poopy Butthole takes advantage of the holes put in your memory and kind of burrows into these pre-existing holes. So he shows up where those parasites are and he's more of a fourth dimensional phantom species that isn't bound by space and only appears in concentrations of temporal Temporal malfunction or misperception and breakdown. Mr. Poopy Butthole is insinuating himself into the universe regardless of the timeline, and the same powers that allow him to do that also allow him to directly talk with the audience. That's us. Okay, so to recap, Mr. Poopy Butthole is an incredibly advanced multidimensional parasite who takes advantage of the instability caused by other parasites. But unlike other parasites, Mr. Poopy Butthole doesn't shift form, he cuddles himself into your memories. So conspiracy solved straight from the source, right? Well, not quite, because you know how I know Mr. Poopy Butthole isn't a shapeshifter? Because we've seen other members of his species. Whether you realize it or not, there have been a number of suspiciously poopy-like characters, Benjamin from Ball Fondlers, Steely from Interdimensional Cable 2, and most recently, Dear Noob Noob from Vindicators 3. Other than their appearance, all four of these characters have something in common. They're all inherently silly, yet they're all strangely unassuming and unthreatening. I mean, Benjamin is in Ball Fondlers, but he's their driver. You don't even ever see him with a gun, just a derpy smile. He's barely a Ball Fondler, but... He is somehow. Steely, well, steals. He shows up in people's lives and immediately leaves, but he addresses the audience in a manner almost exactly reminiscent of Mr. Poopy Butthole. Sure, maybe he's talking to a camera crew, but honestly, how could he be any good at stealing and sneaking if a team of people were following him? And what camera crew can just go through a wall like that? You can actually see the wall in the cut into the manager's office. Which brings us to Noob Noob. Noob Noob is so disposable as a vindicator that he's basically their janitor. His guns for his first mission were immediately traded for a mop so he could be left behind to clean up Rick's horrid mess. But it should be carefully noted that Rick takes an immediate shining to Noob Noob. He becomes obsessed with Noob Noob to the point that he builds a disturbed little Disneyland ride just for him. He cries as he tells Noob Noob how much he appreciates him. He even hires Logic to sing behind him at a party. When was the last time Rick said that he actually appreciated someone, wasted or not? And you know who else Rick showed an uncharacteristic and immediate love for? Our boy, Mr. Poopy Butthole. What if this species' efficacy as a parasite is that they present themselves as the silly, lovable, completely ineffectual underdogs? Their hosts want them around, but they're completely inoffensive. They deliberately present themselves as downtrodden enough to avoid any unwanted attention or to come in any actual line of fire. They're not pathetic or seeking any undue sympathy, a la Jerry, but they help out and do what they're told with fun little one-liners or derpy smiles. It's the perfect solution for them to stay with their hosts and do their parasite thing as long as they please. Though the exception here would be Steely. Steely is more brazen than the other three, plus he's a lone wolf criminal. We can't forget, he's just, he straight up kills a guy. But his line of work is all about laying low and being inconspicuous in plain sight, which seems to be something his species does very well. As far as potential parasiting goes, his whole enterprise seems largely to serve as a way for him to ingratiate himself to us, the audience. Steely might be a rebel for his species, but he still bears a lot of the same tendencies. I'll go one further. The next day, 
after his intense night of drinking and making death traps, Rick has no idea who Noob Noob is. Sure, Morty knows who he is, but Morty just saw Noob Noob that morning. No parasite can remove a memory that easily. And it's entirely possible that just mentioning Mr. Poopy Butthole is taboo around the Smith household. But what if, instead, the Smiths have forgotten about Poopy because, you know, he decided after being shot that he didn't want to stick around and live in their memories anymore? What if after moving to another dimension, the effect his power had on the family's memories slowly faded away and became obsolete? Just like the other parasites. What if getting blackout drunk accelerated this erosion in Rick's memory for Noob Noob? But where's the temporal malfunction or misperception Harmon is talking about? It's interesting to note that both Noob Noob and Benjamin are part of, essentially, superhero teams. Their jobs are guaranteed to put them in situations where there's temporal flux. And Steely, well, he's a rebel. Like I said, he's just going through a self-sufficient phase. Because Steely and post-gun wound Poopy show that the species doesn't need to be parasitic to survive. Nor do I think they're malevolent or dangerous like the other parasites in Total Recall. Seriously, you think Poopy is evil? He, Benjamin, and Noob Noob all seem genuinely social creatures who simply enjoy being around others and just want to hang out. Harmon opened the species subsets on lives like the way that hermit crabs steal other shells. Hermit crabs are vulnerable without their shells, but they make their homes and change them as they see fit. Maybe just like so many other creatures in the Rick and Morty universe, these guys all feel insecure and lonely. They insert themselves into people's memories because they yearn for friendship and camaraderie. Noob Noob, for example, looks incredibly disappointed when he doesn't get to go on the mission. And Poopy looks absolutely miserable living alone, like he got a freaking cat to starve off the loneliness. Instead of going through an excruciatingly slow recovery and needing a cane to get around, if Poopy could return to full health through parasitic means, wouldn't he have returned to the Smiths? Instead of staying with the family he already comfortably asserted himself into as a parasite, he chose to leave their dimension altogether. Why though? If Poopy's intentions were solely parasitic minded, if other people were purely just sources of substance to him, this decision would make no sense at all. Poopy left because the shooting was emotionally traumatic for him. Parasite or not, someone who he felt close to betrayed him. Maybe for Poopy and his species in general, inserting themselves into others' memories is just them combating loneliness the best way that they can. And those methods can fail like they did for Poopy. He looks now to be in a depressive rut. So what if we concluded. First, that Mr. Poopy Butthole species are advanced, multidimensional parasites who insert themselves into host memories, but whose effects on hosts do actually fade over time. Second, they use their parasitic abilities not for evil means or for sustenance in a conventional way, but because they crave companionship. And lastly, their success as a parasitic species comes from the fact that they are silly enough to want to have around and inconspicuous enough to be allowed to stay. All in all, I'd say this theory holds up pretty well and not just because the creators helped it along. I'd have to give this theory four grapples out of five. Ready to learn more about the Citadel? Well, too bad. Roll the tape. By his own word, Rick is the smartest man in the universe. Or to put it more correctly, Ricks are supposed to be the smartest men in the multiverse. Is the unified intelligence of millions of Ricks what kept the Citadel of Ricks together when the Council of Ricks was murdered instead of the Citadel collapsing like the Galactic Federation? No, it wasn't. Even if there was some kind of solidarity between all of the Ricks and the Citadel, if the Rick Lantis mix up taught us anything, it's that hyper intelligence doesn't always mean you pull out ahead. Usually, there are other forces at play, especially if you're in a situation that makes you feel stuck. Hey everyone, I'm Justin with Channel Frederator, and today on Cartoon Conspiracy, we're going deep down into the psyche of the Citadel of Ricks to figure out what glued it together in the absence of leadership, but how it's still falling apart. So here's what we know. The Citadel of Ricks is a large city-state originally created to hide Rick from their many, many enemies speckled around the multiverse. Since its inception, the population of the Citadel has burst from the thousands to the millions, but that population consists solely of Ricks and Mortys from different dimensions. The Citadel of Ricks was originally an oligarchy government by an elite few not elected by the citizenry. However, the council was under the thumb of the Shadow Council of Ricks, made up of nine highly successful businessman Ricks. Business Ricks. Then Rick C-137, our Rick, teleported to the Citadel into a federal prison and murdered the Council of Ricks. Next time we see the Citadel, 
it's in the process of rebuilding and has become a democracy on the precipice of its first presidential election. In a gigantic upset, the Morty Party's candidate wins the race. However, for the Citadel, new Morty president just so happens to be our much-awaited Evil Morty, last seen puppeting an Evil Rick in closer encounters of the Rick kind. Evil Morty kills all but two of the Shadow Council and establishes what looks like an awful lot like a totalitarian dictatorship. Now, there's two questions this summation leaves behind. One, why did the Citadel dissolve when the Council of Ricks was murdered? And two, where do we go from here? Turn all the lights down now. <laughs> Why the Citadel didn't make like the Galactic Federation and collapse is an unsurprisingly complicated question. It's tempting to go for more fantastical dystopian answers, for example, what if the impossible flavor of your own completion or the taste of shattering the grand illusion that makes up simple Ricks is some kind of massive population sedative, like Soma in Aldous Huxley's Brave New World. And in case you forgot your high school literature classes, Soma was a drug made by the government that allowed the user to forget pain and unpleasant emotions and enhance feelings of well-being. The government used it to suppress its citizens, and what if Simple Ricks was a similar drug, not as powerful, but still able to keep the population of the Citadel complacent enough not to stage a rebellion? It's a really fun theory, but honestly, it, it has its holes. For one, you can see a Shadow Council member eating simple Ricks, and why would someone in the ruling class eat something designed to subdue citizens? Also, what about Mortys? The ad's target audience is clearly Ricks, yet Mortys are half the Citadel's population. While it's 100% valid to think of simple Ricks as an escapist drug, it seems nowhere near powerful enough for a Soma-level government conspiracy. My guess is that eating simple Ricks is more like having a fun night of drinking, but with waking up the next morning feeling just a bit sadder than you were before, but you know, on the scale of you could get a buzz from a wafer cookie. But the most important takeaway is this, if Simple Ricks really worked that thoroughly, why would almost everyone in the Citadel seem so goddamn sad? One of the opening shots of the Rick Lantis experiment juxtaposes a wealthy Rick drinking some bubbly in a sweet ship against a blue collar Rick on a train who sees the wealthy Rick and sighs deeply. This sets up the conundrum of the Citadel perfectly. As Evil Morty emphasizes in his debate speech, these Ricks have the same IQ. The class divide in the Citadel isn't as simple as Ricks on top, Morty's on bottom. There's internal class hierarchies among people with the exact same DNA. It's ridiculous. How is it that some have menial, unskilled jobs like the simple Ricks factory workers while other Ricks get to be the boss? The answer is deeply, darkly sewn into the fabric of the Rick Lantis experiment, simple luck. In any big city with a large pool of potential workers, especially one whose population suddenly skyrocketed like the Citadels, certain people are just going to be at the right place in the right time, regardless if they're better or worse or exactly the same at a particular job. Cool Rick gets to be the floor manager of Simple Ricks, even though he's new to the Citadel. The line worker who's been there 15 years stays in the same place, and why? I'd guess random insidery circles of favor and want and opportunity. There's no reason why one Rick should be a boss and then have another just be a factory worker. The two could be switched with little to no difference in the factory's ability to function because they are literally just both Rick Sanchez. But at the risk of sounding like I'm leading a philosophy class, the circumstances they've chanced upon have grown them apart and made them truly different individuals, one entitled and easygoing, the other bitter, depressed, and frustrated. When you hear that the Citadel of Ricks is comprised entirely of Ricks and Mortys, you'd expect minimally different variations on two personalities. But diving into the city's daily life, you see that's clear clearly not the case. Evil Morty's very existence is a clear example of how these supposedly set personality types can wildly mutate. Why do the Ricks who got thrown on the bottom rung feel any obligation at all to the Citadel? Couldn't they just leave at any time, back to their Beth and Summers? Don't they all have portal guns? There was one line in the Rick Lantis experiment that really stuck out to me. When Cop Morty and Cop Rick bust into Morty Town Loco's hideout, Cop Morty comments on how their Rick was using bootleg portal fluid. So does the government or some some ruling body in the absence of one control who owns a portal gun? Remember too that the fed up simple Rick's factory worker had to include a portal gun in his demands. Plus the squad sent to handle the situation had to formally request one, which sure could easily be due to the bureaucracy, but it's still curious. Add this to a seemingly unaffiliated line in Morty's mind blowers when Morty 
with squirrels, Rick says they have to move to another reality. He frustratedly exclaims, I said we could only do that a couple of times. Suppose even just a fraction of the multiverses Rick's and Morty's had to jump dimensions a couple times, just like ours have had to. Even if you have infinite possible realities, if enough Rick's and Morty's were destroying even a few dimensions, each for all versions of themselves, wouldn't you get dangerously close to running up against that infinite curve? Why else could Rick and Morty only jump dimensions a couple of times? What if this paradox means that the Ricks and Mortys in the Citadel have nowhere else to go? The Citadel was made to protect Ricks from their enemies across the multiverse, and what if that means the circle in which Ricks can actually walk around are slowly shrinking? They're not welcome in their own realities, and they're running out of realities to jump to. Plus, even if these Ricks did have somewhere to go, what if they can't get there because most can't have a portal gun? I know what you're thinking. Didn't Rick invent the portal gun? Couldn't any old Rick just build one and get out of there? But let's circle back to our discussion of class. Let's talk about depression. What happens when the society you live in squashes your morale so much that the simple thought of getting out doesn't even occur to you or seems pointless or too much effort? Imagine you work on the line at Simple Ricks. You move to the Citadel because your own dimension got warped past fixing, Cronenberg. You could only find a boring entry level job, the work slowly wore on you, you hate your job, you feel lonely, you feel hopeless because you're worried you've dead ended. You've become depressed and just trying to figure out how to leave seems like too much of a hassle. But you think about building a portal gun but you can't get back to your original dimension and you're sick of squeezing yourself into new ones. Not to mention that most versions of you have managed to anger lots of people so you stay because you don't know what else to do. Now imagine you're just a Morty living in Morty Town. You've been told your whole life that you're dumb and expendable and that you're just a sidekick to enable someone innately better than you to go about his business. You end up in the Citadel through decisions that probably weren't even your own and you can't get out without making yourself subservient to another Rick. It's like Cop Morty. He wanted to be a normal kid but was infuriated whenever anyone suggested he was second to Rick. He grew embittered and got caught in the stream that sweeps up most of the Ricks and Mortys that live in the Citadel. He felt like he had something to prove when you're in the current it's it's hard to swim out do you see what i mean usually when a civilization transfers from one type of government to another all hell breaks loose and picking up any history book will back me up on this you expect protests you expect angry mobs in the streets or people in power killing each other to stay in power but inside the citadel of ricks there were no protests that we could see and the only mobs were ones cloning themselves into babies so the morty candidate could kiss it doesn't that seem a little too civil? But obviously on the ground, the Citadel is not civil at all. Society has devolved into two strata, the rich and the poor, who are alienated from one another. Crime rates seem out of control, Ricks and Mortys alike kill each other with ease, there's increased tension between citizenry and the police and military, people can become so frustrated with the system that they kill their own boss. The Citadel is awash with the kind of general unrest among citizens that in a democratic setting would lead to an irregular choice of political representation. But at this point, it kind of feels like I'm not even talking about the Citadel of Ricks anymore. It sounds cliche to bring up, but when a large disenfranchised portion of your population gets restless, dictatorships have an opening to parade into the picture. A populist candidate comes along promising sympathy, promising equality, but uses the frustration of the masses to ride to the top and steal total control over the government. Enter Evil Morty. Rick C-137 thinks the Citadel is taken care of, but if the low-level Ricks and Mortys living at the Citadel didn't take to the streets in protest because of depression, resignation, and lack of alternatives, the problem isn't solved. It's simmering. A totalitarian regime isn't likely to solve that problem either. Instead, the Ricks who are on top now feel like they're suffering as well. What if we started with the wrong question? The question isn't why did the Citadel dissolve, but when will it? The ascension of Evil Morty makes the Citadel seem like Rome before the fall. The tensions beneath like lighting a very, very long fuse on a stick of dynamite and just waiting for it to reach the stick. So in short, the theory is this, that Ricks and Mortys in the Citadel didn't rebel because they were stagnated by their own depression, that this depression is in part because the dimension jumping of numerous Ricks has caused a narrowing window of opportunity that makes many feel like they're running out of options, that the Citadel regulates who owns a portal gun, and finally, that the political unrest from class tensions isn't settled, it's yet to bump over. In trying to make light of what may be the most depressing cartoon conspiracy I've ever done, 
I'd give this theory four locker headshots of Jessica out of five. And to top it all off, how about a video with a whole bunch more theories? Yeah, that sounds like a good time. Happy belated Thanksgiving to everyone who is celebrating. I hope you enjoyed your time by eating a ton of food, probably watching a ton of football, and probably watching a bunch of YouTube videos in a desperate attempt to avoid interacting with your family. It's okay, you can admit it, I totally understand. We're your family now. And speaking of Thanksgiving, did you see that new Rick and Morty short that went up during the weekend? It was a strangely moving look into the life of Mr. Poopy Butthole between seasons two and three. I know you're waiting for a punchline, but there isn't one. I'm not joking. It was actually really touching. But having seen that, we can't help but wonder, well, what are we gonna do this break? At this point, season four could be literal years away, so there's ample time for us to ask, What's gonna happen next? I mean, the season ended on a bit of a weird note, effectively rebooting the series anew, so... Now what? Well, that is what we're gonna talk about today. I'm Jacob with Channel Frederator, and let's do something a little different this week and take a quick look at some Rick and Morty theories that have risen to prominence since the airing of season three. Think of it as kinda like three little Rick and Morty mini-sodes of cartoon conspiracy. Mini-sodes like that Mr. Poopy Butthole short that went up last week, and I literally just made that connection now, but whatever, let's just go with it. We've got a lot to cover, so let's dive right into our first theory, which is that Rick and Morty actually takes place over a shuffled timeline. Not alternate timelines, not time travel, but one consistent chronological timeline that's simply presented out of order. You know, like a Christopher Nolan movie that's set in space, not that one though. This theory seems to originate from a thread by Reddit user Callie Mattress, who noticed that depending on which episode you're watching, the characters seem to act different. They always keep the same core personality traits, but the way that they act and react to certain situations seems to change randomly. Being Rick and Morty, this led them to the conclusion that all of these differences in character actions obviously mean that these are all alternate universe versions of all of these characters. And I mean, that makes sense. To give the understatement of the century, it's not exactly something that's unprecedented in this show. But this theory goes on to suggest that through the entire run of the series, we've actually been seeing two stories play out in two different universes Versus, but presented to us as if they were happening simultaneously. When in reality, one story actually chronologically happened before the other one. The first timeline, in what Callie Mattress calls Universe 5126, details Rick's adventures with his first Morty, who would eventually become Evil Morty. Following this less than desirable outcome, Rick leaves Universe 5126 and hightails it to good old C-137, where he starts over with a new Morty where the present day timeline begins. So instead of the series chronology looking like this, it should actually look like what you're seeing on screen right now. The common thread of this timeline, of course, being Rick, who is always the same Rick. You know what? I'm gonna need a visual for this one. Okay, so according to Cali Mattress, when our Rick inhabited Universe 5126, he was significantly more impulsive and careless than now, where he's shown to be a little kinder and significantly more depressed than previously. Meanwhile, you have other characters like Morty, whose 5126 variation appeared to be smarter, more courageous, and much more successful with women than C-137 Morty who is more of a follower, less successful with the ladies, and not quite as smart. Based on that, it would make sense that 5126 Morty would eventually become Evil Morty. He seems to have all of the qualifications. And Callie Mattress pointed out subtle character differences in the rest of our main heroes as well. They go into way more detail, so I'll link to the thread in the comments if you want to give it a read, but this is the simple version. But, of course, how does this theory hold up? Well, this theory was proposed when season three was still airing, so they were only able to sort through the episodes up until Rest and Ricklaxation, which they claimed happened in Universe 5126. So let's see if we can't finish their job for them. Although we don't really need to, because in the very next episode, there's a massive contradiction if we're to assume the truth of this graph. In the Ricklantis mix-up, Evil Morty is already present, and by the end of the episode, he's ruling the Citadel. But at the same time, the Morty that accompanied Rick was both more abrasive and apparently had a fling with a mermaid in Atlantis. And these are both personality traits that would supposedly apply to 5126 Morty. Evil Morty, who's already present elsewhere in the episode. Not to mention that the events of this episode are a direct result of what happened in the Rick Shank Rick Dention, which is an episode that they claim happened in the C-137 timeline. So the whole notion of this being a 5126 episode is completely gone. So with this in mind, that leaves us with one of two possibilities. Either A, a chart like this can still be applied, it's just that the parameters of this one are inaccurate, or B, character differences are just the result of having different writers on the show. And while some 
motivations may appear inconsistent in the grand scheme, a lot of their actions come out of a necessity to move the plot forward. Not to mention that since this theory focuses so intently on individual character traits, it kind of ignores a lot of overarching plot details throughout the rest of the season. Things like, you know, Beth and Jerry's separation, which I guess would have to have happened in both timelines, I guess? I mean, you know, before it completely stops making sense. So with all of this in mind on the plausibility meter, as much as it pains me because I love this idea, I'd have to rate this shuffled timeline theory one eye patch out of five. Next up, let's for a bit discuss that niggling doubt that the season finale left all of us with that we may never get a straight answer for. Did Rick actually clone Beth? Well, Rick does say in the Rickturian Morty did that he didn't clone Beth, but when has Rick ever been someone we can trust when he's not trying to benefit himself. And the end of the episode, much like the ABCs of Beth, backpedals and makes it all ambiguous again. As Rick told Beth, no matter the outcome, it's still symbolic of Beth having made a choice. Which brings her a step closer to self-discovery, which means that Rick doesn't have to deal with her emotional strife anymore. It's just that as far as we can tell, he didn't realize that this would lead to him being relegated to the bottom of the family dynamic. But some theories have stated if Beth is a clone, it could open up some interesting story opportunities. What if, for example, our Beth did clone her? herself and then went out on a bunch of crazy adventures like her father. I mean, we all know that she still respects and kind of idolizes her father even after the ABCs of Beth. So could she eventually become her father as she previously stated in that episode? Yeah! Oh my god, I'm my father! Could we even see a council of Beths in the future? Actually, more importantly, can we confirm any of these thoughts? Does it even matter in this case? Well, firstly, in the ABCs of Beth, Rick tells Beth that the clone would have zero chance of becoming self-aware and going Blade Runner. And in the very next episode, Beth starts freaking out that she might be a clone, so these two facts don't seem to gel that well. Plus, we found that earlier in the season, Rick has literally devised a method to erase memories. So if Beth did clone herself, why wouldn't Rick just start start Beth's mind blowers and remove the memory of the clone being a clone to begin with. And while the idea of a council of Beths is really cool, it's still nothing but just baseless speculation. But the reason we're not actually spending a whole lot of time on this theory is because no matter what the show teases us or whatever evidence we can pull, it really doesn't matter. In a multiverse of infinite possibilities, some Beths probably took Rick up on his offer. So regardless of what happened to our Beth, all eventualities will probably play out anyway. That's pretty much the point of this whole dilemma, and since I got served two weeks ago by the creator of Hey Arnold, I should probably take authorial intent a bit more seriously. So on the plausibility meter that I'm not gonna pull up, I'm gonna have to give this like Schrodinger's rating. It's in a constant super state of zero out of five and five out of five, because by the show's own mission, this train of thought is pretty irrelevant in the grand scheme. Next, we've got the amazing theory that's been thrown around since the season finale, which is that any discussion about season four is premature because season three isn't over yet. And as crazy as it is, there's actually way more supporting evidence for this theory than there probably should be. After all, season three was originally supposed to be 14 episodes that got cut down to 10, so... Who's to say that number isn't actually 11? Firstly, let's not forget that the first episode of season three did air on April Fool's Day several months before the season continued, which forced us to never ever trust anything to come out of the mouths of Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland ever again. See, this is why April Fool's Day is the worst holiday, because even when good stuff happens, I still develop trust issues. But because of this unorthodox method of airing episodes, this has led some people to believe that maybe there's one more still down the line for us, maybe sometime next month, which leads us to our next argument. After the supposed season three finale, Mr. Poopy Butthole teased us about the premiere of season four, saying that the next time we saw him, I might even have a big white Santa Claus beard. Naturally, this has made people think that maybe there's a Christmas special that they've been saving for us. After all, networks like the BBC are known for airing one episode holiday specials of their long running series, with many people pointing to Doctor Who as a prime example of this. A show that Rick mentions in the supposed season three finale, comparing himself to the Time Lord. And finally, earlier, when season three was still airing, after the Ricklantis mix-up, but before the Rickturian Morty date, Dan Harmon himself heavily implied in an interview that Evil Morty would return at the end of the season. But then, of course, the episode aired and... nothing. No Evil Morty. So between these three things and a lot of other random pieces of circumstantial evidence, like writer Ryan Ridley being shown here in a behind-the-scenes interview from September wearing a Rick and Morty Christmas sweater, What's going on here? Is there enough evidence out there to suggest that season three isn't actually over yet? I mean, look, at this point, we pretty much can't trust anything that the creators or the writers or the staff directly say. 
like ever. It seems like the more that they want us to believe something, it's more likely that that thing probably isn't true. They are absolute masters at messing with us. While some seem to be teasing us with the possibility, others are going in the completely opposite direction. Here's a tweet of writer Dan Guterman vehemently denying the existence of a Christmas episode. But putting aside any direct remarks from creators or staff, this is surprisingly solid. I mean, my knee-jerk reaction would be to criticize this theory for aimlessly comparing the BBC's broadcast standards to America's and then calling the whole thing a desperate reach by those who were disappointed by the season finale. But Adult Swim has made a name for itself in unique broadcast methods. They've already aired one episode wildly out of step with the rest of the season. Who's to say they won't do it again? And between this, the Doctor Who remark, Mr. Poopy Butthole's remark, and the other subtler things like that Christmas sweater, I'm split in thinking that this is either totally true or a truly pointless misdirection that has had way too much thought put into it. I'm actually kind of conflicted here. The evidence is pretty solid, but I have massive trust issues. So on the plausibility meter, call it wishful thinking, but I'm going to rate the plausibility of season three not being over yet, 2.5 of Mr. Poopy Butthole's hats out of five. And finally, we're going to end with something all around more plausible, which is the significance of the scene we see in Morty's mind blowers of Mr. Poopy Butthole proposing to Morty. The answer? Based on the newest short released last week, we see that Mrs. Poopy Butthole was proposed to in the same spot. So the most likely answer is that this was probably just a practice run, and Rick and Morty were helping their buddy get over those proposal jitters. Maybe the memory was erased because Rick didn't want Morty to know that he cared. Or maybe Morty fell in love with Mr. Poopy Butthole. Or maybe Morty wanted the engagement to be a surprise to him. No more evidence, no more discussion. This is my headcanon now, and nobody can take it from me. This theory gets 4.5 of Mr. Poopy Butthole's engagement rings out of 5. And there we go. So many Rick and Morty theories, I'm starting to question reality again. Oh, man, my talking dog's gonna be pissed. What did you think about all the theories? Which hold water and which are leaky as hell? Do you have any theories ahead of season 7? Make sure you let us know down in the comments and subscribe to Channel Frederator for more like this. Thanks for watching, and remember, Frederator loves you.